Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session of our May 5th public hearing. Um, we are going to be starting with item number, public hearing item number 460 Hudson Street. Um, I will turn it over to the Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, to uh, start the afternoon agenda. If anyone would like to, yeah, and if anyone would like to testify on this particular item, now is the time to call in or enter the meeting. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so item number four is LPC 20-05764, an application for a certificate of appropriateness number of Manhattan block 144, lot 40, 60 Hudson Street, the Western Union Building interior landmark, an Art Deco style communications <laughs> building designed by Ralph Walker of Voorhees, uh, Mellon and Walker and built in 1928 to 30. The application is to install turnstiles and desks within the designated interior. And commissioners, the applicant has joined the meeting and please state your name for the record and you may begin by clicking on the presentation. I need to be unmuted by the host. You are unmuted now, you may begin. Hi, my name is George Boyle. I am representing 60 Hudson Street. And how do I get onto the actual presentation? Uh, you just need to Coming stick up. your mouse and click on it and then you can use the arrow keys as needed. There we go, thank you. Okay, so uh, I apologize for this, it's not going back. Okay, I'm just going to advance. There you go. No, I think to go to the first one if you can. All right, let's. Try. Okay. Uh, it's. I'm not touching anything, and it's doing that. But uh, so be it. Uh, we'll start with the first slide. I don't know if this is not me doing this. By the way, someone's doing this. So there is a lag. What I can do instead is just advance the slides on your behalf. And so if you Thank just you. want to- Thank you. Okay, if you keep it on that one, one, that'd be great. Um, sure, just give me one moment. And sure. then um, just wanna leave it on this one. And then when you wanna advance, just uh, indicate that to advance a slide. Thank you. Well, if you could actually go back to that, would, I would appreciate it. Keep going back. One more. There we go. Thank you. So um, 60 Hudson Street is, um, as you know, was the former Western Union building. It was one of the most wired buildings of its time. It had over 70 million square feet of wiring. And today its use is, is basically continued. It's uh, in essence a communications building and is probably one of the most important hubs of the internet uh, for the United States. In fact, this project, this Zoom meeting is probably going through this building. Uh, what has happened since then is that that technology has miniaturized and the need for as much square footage has changed. So the owners of the building are now marketing this building uh, for commercial and office space. Uh, to do that, we need a more robust system for turnstiles and security uh, at the lobby. So if you could go to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. This just shows the limits of the actual designated lobby. You can go to the following slide. Here are some photos of, of some of the detailing that happens within this. You know, Walker basically brought the outside in. All the walls and ceilings are vaulted brick uh, and they have a tremendous amount of bronze detailing that, you know, in our opinion, Walker touched everything on this building. Uh, everything from the grills to this beautiful mailbox uh, that exists there. Uh, as well as the center photo shows in 1999, uh, the building prior to us being involved 
uh, had gotten a, a approval for a second uh, desk that is sentry located. This desk is actually used for the fire alarm system and, and has nothing to do with sort of the security of, of getting in and out for, for tenants and stuff. So we go to the next photo, the next slide would be great. This is just trying to show you, uh, there are two entrances to this building. One is on Hudson and one is on West Broadway. This is trying to show you the existing conditions along Hudson Street. So in essence, you go from the outside through a little anti-foyer, through some revolving doors, and then are stopped immediately by a security person and some antiquated temporary, but it been there probably for 20 years, uh, not even really turnstiles, just barriers, so to speak. Uh, one of the biggest complaints, especially from the, the tenants that, not the tenants, from the, the neighbors is that there is no way to kind of enjoy this, this public space or this private space, but to get inside of this interior. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, this is the same uh, idea of showing the existing conditions along West Broadway. Again, it's the same principle. As soon as you go past the revolving doors, the, there is the security. Uh, Part of this is that there aren't that many occupants in this building. So this has worked fairly well for, for a long time. Now that, that they're expecting a, a tremendous difference in terms of occupancy, we need to have a more robust system. So if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this shows, uh, and maybe I can do with this arrow now, uh, what our ex the existing and the proposed plan is for this. So again, the barrier starts here. What we're proposing along Hudson Street is to open up this hallway that we call Hudson Hall to the public. So now we're moving the turnstiles from where we're close to where the revolving doors are beyond this hallway over to where the corridor for the elevator starts. Uh, that way, at least now, people can come in and enjoy this space and frankly, the space itself can actually be activated because currently right now, you just everyone just walks through, uh, through this. We're doing the same kind of principle uh, along on West Broadway, which is to bring the turnstiles further in, turn the, the reception desk on its side so it creates the vista along the, the main space. So if we go to the next slide, I appreciate it. Here's a, a better detail of, of, in plan, the condition along Hudson Street. Again, we're, we're floating a, a desk over here so that uh, people, the security people is equal distance between both the revolving door and the turnstile, and that they have the access to both sides. Uh, we can go to the following slide. Here are some renderings showing the, the existing and the proposed. One of the things you'll see is that, uh, quite frankly, these, this lobby is, is dimly lit. And part of it is also your perception because you're coming from the outside and then you're going into this kind of brick cave and your eye takes a tremendous amount of time to kind of adapt to what are, I, I think it's, it's almost four lumens. It's very, it's like candle lit uh, space. So what we're trying to do here is to make it so that uh, a, a, a visitor who's coming in here will at least be able to tell where this desk is, that it is visually seen, but it's not obscuring the main vista. So what we're proposing is a, a non-directional uh, bronze finish that's faceted in very similar ways to other details within the, uh, the space. And that one can go and see that it's underlit from above, uh, right at the, the top of the desk. And then that there is indirect lighting uh, at the lower level that is uh, part of the terrazzo. So if we go to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. This is just a, a bigger detail. And please remember these are wide angle photographs. So everything is a little bit more skewed than what it is. But the idea is that is to create a, a, a desk that is sort of subtly understood, but also not part of the main space that you can see through and, and capture the, the vista that's going across. We can go to the following slide. Again, this is just a, once you pass that reception desk, this is where you go into the main corridor where the elevator banks are and the, the two other desks are. You can go to the following slide. This is on, on West Broadway. Again, it's the same principle we're trying to do, which is to bring the turnstiles as far in as possible. One of the things that were required by code is since there is an egress stair, we have to put a gate 
uh, and it's a glass gate so that if there is a, ever a fire that uh, one can easily access through that. You can go to the following slide, please. Here are two, again, before and after, trying to show the, the kind of extent of the wall that exists as you walk in now, whereas now you feel like you're actually getting part of, of this space and, and being part of it. So you can go to the following slide. And this is a, a further detail trying to show that we're again, trying not to obscure the, the main access of this, of this space, but still to create a desk that uh, is visible and, and recognizable. If you go to the next, the next slide, please. Again, here's a past the reception desk. Here's what uh, we're proposing to do. We tried to stay away from doing glass doors on the turnstiles just because we felt that that was going to create more of a fence than, uh, than these turnstiles, which are just a single arm on top. Uh, so again, it, they'll have as minimal effect as possible. The, the finish on the turnstiles themselves is very similar to the desks. It's a uh, non-directional uh, finish uh, bronze with a cap of the same type of um, dark brown. Uh, Corian. Yeah, the next slide, please. These are just elevations showing the, the various widths and the, the two gates on both sides for both Hudson and West Broadway. And this is the, a rendering of the desk to try to show kind of the different materials. So what we have on top is a uh, Corian Deep Espresso, it's called. It's a very dark brown uh, top that is, is uh, going to be very durable. Then right below that, we have a small little angular shelf so that when someone comes to the desk, if they have a pocketbook or a briefcase, that they can have something to put it on to get out their identification. Underneath that, we're indirectly lighting that. And then we have the main panels, which are faceted, uh, are these non-directional finish. Unfortunately, you know, based on this presentation, we really can't show you these, uh, these finishes, but the the bronze, the reason we did this non-directional, which is basically uh, an orbital sander to a bronze finish is to, to kind of lower the, the, the shininess of this and to make it more of a, a shimmer than, than to a real uh, bold gold, bright gold to it. Uh, again, then on, down below, we do have a, a, a terrazzo-like uh, base that we're proposing. So we go to the next slide, please. These are just elevations showing both the plan and uh, sections and elevations. Uh, in the side over here will be the ADA accessible area that has to be at a lower level. Uh, and again, here's the top shelf for, and here's where the shelf where I was talking about where people could put their uh, pocketbooks or briefcases. And the next slide, please. These are some standard details that show uh, the actual turnstiles that are by, made by Genobo that uh, we will be mounting these things into the floor. And here are some details of where those, those holes will be. You go to the following slide. Same with the gate that, that exists. It's gonna be a glass gate. that's going to have a, a logo of 60 Hudson on it so that uh, one could see that it actually is uh, glass. And the next slide, please. And finally, this is just to, to show where we were looking at, at examples of, of various different turnstiles in, in landmark lobbies. Uh, the sister building to 60 Hudson Street is just down the street, it's the AT&T building. Uh, fortunately for them, they had enough width in their elevator corridor to do turnstiles. Uh, we are about a foot and a half short. And that is why we had to come up with this second proposal of how we did it. Uh, because originally we liked the idea of opening the entire uh, corridor for the lobby from, from street to street, but there is no way we can do it. And that is the end of my, my presentation. I'm willing to take any questions. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? Please raise your hand if you have a question. All right, I just have one question, uh, George. You're choosing the um, non-directional bronze. Are there other bronze features within this landmark space that you're relating to? And then similarly, the faceted design, is that relating to something in the space? It, it absolutely does. And if we go back to the photos that uh, 
I think it's the third photo that shows the existing hallway, existing photos. Uh, Walker did virtually, as I said, you know, you can see it here. Walker touched everything in this building. And uh, so at the bottom of those grates, as I explained, you can oh, look up at, at top at, at how we kind of edged all the brick. Uh, even the, the elevator controls were detailed, you know, quite extensively. Uh, as you know, we've done some other work in this building and we've been trying to follow and, and, and echo, but not duplicate. Uh, we're trying to capture the same spirit. Uh, again, our idea here was with these, these desks is that we felt that if we were to put any kind of masonry desk, like what's there right now, floating outside in that hallway, it would just look odd. And these work very successfully, I think, because they look like they're part of the wall. Ours can't because we are in a, in a more floating position. Uh, and we also are concerned about the, the light levels that are existing here to make it so that uh, one can actually recognize and see where these things are. Uh, so that, that was the intent for, for what we did. Okay, thank you. So sure. I see Commissioner Jefferson has a question who will be followed by Commissioner Holford Smith. Go ahead, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, my question is, if you go to your um, materials board, um, that one, the, the material is flat, correct? I mean, the, um, uh, the, the metal is flat. It is not, no, it's, you can see. So go, like, go to your plan and is your plan, am I seeing a faceted front? Is that what I'm looking at? Yes. You are, and it, it is, this is part of the, you know, welcome to Zoom. Uh, it doesn't show up as well. Maybe perhaps on the, if we go to one of the renderings inside the, uh, keep going back. Keep going back. Uh, slightly, slightly. Yeah, this it's a very subtle thing. You can see it here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it, it's yeah, meant, yeah, it's it's meant yeah, to be very it, subtle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Commissioner Halford Smith. My question was uh, somewhat related. Um, in these images, it it looks like this sort of one sheet that's been folded. Um, but it has to be built in, in presumably in panels. So are you anticipating just making those, those joint lines completely disappear or what is your intent for, for actually- Yes, how and, and we've, actually, we've actually done that previously on the, uh, the ballards that exist uh, outside of Hudson, um, the Hudson entrance. So yes, our, our intent here is to do it in a, in a seamless way. So it'll be bent. Okay. okay, thank you. Other commissioners with questions? Okay, not seeing any hands raised. Um, we'll turn to public testimony. Lisa, do we have anyone who is waiting to speak? Well, we did not have anybody sign up to speak, but we do have somebody in the waiting room. Um, I will try and quickly admit them to see if they're here for this item. Sean, uh, can you hear me? Sean? Okay. He's, he's um, waving, he's waving no. He doesn't, he doesn't want to speak on this one. Okay, so Sean, please join the meeting later. And I think with that, that is everybody. Okay, thank you. Rich, do we have any resolution from the community board or other written testimony? Yes, we just had the resolution from Manhattan Community Board one recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, are there any final questions? All right, then I think we will make a motion to close the hearing. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make that motion? Moved. Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second it. Okay, and in a minute we will vote on that. Okay, and all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed and we'll start the discussion. Um, 
let me see, Commissioner uh, Holford Smith, you had a question. So I wonder if you've had some thoughts about the response and maybe that could start the discussion. Sure. Um, I guess my feeling is that it won't be entirely possible to make something so big not have seams in it. And I just want those should be more expressed and relate better to the detailing of the bronze work in the lobby. Um, and I think the, the base, I'm a little troubled by the, by the material that's being used for the base. And I wonder if, if it just be a, like a black material. Um, other than that, I think it's, it's um, appropriate. Okay, great. <clears throat> and Commissioner Shamir Barron? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the difference, uh, what the quality of the finish is on the, I'm assuming those are, uh, if, and uh, forgive me if I missed it, bronze uh, details, the ornamental details in the lobby, are they bronze or brass? Uh, what, what are they? I I'm believe sorry. they are bronze, but we'll ask Corey if, to answer the question if he can. Thanks. Uh, yes, that is correct. That's my understanding as well. They're, yeah. They're well, cast bronze materials. Thank you, cast bronze, exactly. And I think that that's the thing. If, you know, if, this, if the desk had the quality of the cast bronze, whether in the form of sort of applied um, material that's been previously cast or had that kind of sheen about it, that would be one thing. Um, uh, but, I, but it doesn't. It looks more like the turnstiles. And I don't think, I think the desk should not look like the turnstiles. So, Again, if it, 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 if it could be more like the metal, the, the metal, the bronze material, that would be one thing. If not, I actually think it should be stone, uh, all black or all kind of that red colored um, and look as kind of monolithic as, as like a single object as, as possible. Okay. Because it doesn't <clears throat> either, you know, I mean, right now it's not, it's not relating to the bronze and it's not really relating to the terrazzo or the brick. Okay, great. Commissioner Gustafson? Uh, I, I agree completely with Commissioner Shabir Bar Barron. The, uh, the existing, the proposal, uh, I find it to be inappropriate only because it doesn't seem to actually marry up with any of the existing materials. And I, you know, while I probably have a preference for a masonry finish, um, I, uh, I would find the uh, cast uh, bronze appropriate as well. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I, I think the planning um, uh, of moving, moving things back is very good. I think the axial view worked wonderfully. I do think that the desk itself should be one solid material rather than broken up into three different materials, you know, top, middle, and bottom. And I think it, it'll hold the space better. Okay, thank you. Commissioner um, Lutfi. Um, I'm gonna have a slightly different opinion here. I, um, first of all, I think it's wonderful that this lobby is gonna be more opened up um, for access and congregation as the building transforms itself. Um, I actually, um, I, like in plan what they've done, the fact that they've moved this desk over to the side so that it, it's not, you know, it doesn't get in the way visually and you are not really paying attention to it. And, and from a design standpoint, I think it's good that it relates uh, in terms of the materials to the turnstiles. And I, I like the materials that they've used. I like the, the bronze. I mean, I don't think it has to be exactly like what's there in terms of the finish, but the finish seems like it's a very a cl clean finish and uh, the colors work well. So I think it's fine. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Um, well, I spent the whole presentation wondering why uh, the applicant couldn't follow the uh, what was done recently in my own building where we are um, where my firm is located 120 Broadway 
which reopened the entire thing. And then you, you saved that right into the last slide, uh, preempting my question entirely, saying it's too narrow that the distance between the elevator um, uh, doors across from each other are too narrow. So I accept this as a planning device that it's, it's better than it was, but it's too bad you can't open it all up and let the public walk through this magnificent space. At least they get to see it, unlike what the Woolworth building tries to do. Uh, which is to shoo you out if you ever walk in those doors and see one of the great lobbies of the country. Um, I, you know, I was ready to say this is fine the way it is. I mean, I, these things come and go and there'll be another one some year and it's okay. But whoever was suggesting a monolithic, even black, began to get my interest because I thought um, another shiny object in this incredibly shiny maybe dimly lit space, but at least this rendering shows it to be shiny, maybe would be better letting the shiny things that are original uh, continue to be their own thing and let it just a very simple black, um, and it could be, it could be masonry or uh, you know, granite, or it could be a metal. But I'm, so, so I don't know, I'm sort of betw betwixt and between, but um, I think black might be better if there's any sentiments for that around the table. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, this is the, the thing that um, is an interesting question what the Commissioner Blend just raised, which is that uh, obviously you have two, you have a couple of approaches. One is to keep it similar to the material that's uh, existing in this elegant lobby, or you make it uh, say that this is an addition and with a new material. So. Uh, given that the, the screen is rather small and the detail is hard to read, um, and also being that it's uh, dimly lit, it's not, uh, uh, just wonder whether the black surface, unless it's delineated with the border, uh, would that be visible or just somebody going to bump into it? Uh, but uh, the black uh, um, granite or something is always a very elegant material, but uh, without knowing the the lighting level without knowing the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the context how it is used uh, is hard to to make a decision or render a, a judgment for me at this moment. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Um, I agree with Commissioner uh, Barron the about the bronze, but I I think there's enough bronze detailing in this lobby that the desk itself could match those other bronze pieces and not and not vary from them but it does have to be a, a really good strong bronze okay. and i'm okay with the placement of them all great commissioner goldblum boy what a what an array of options um <laughs> i i think that um uh I fall in, but I could I could go either way, really. Uh, I think that for for uh, uh, for those who want to keep the bronze, and I, that was my first instinct. I think the problem with with the desk is is it's too monolithic and too, and apart from the finish, which is an easy one to fix. I think that the scale of the of the bronze work is very very ponderous, um, and if you look at it at the you know the the level of detail and the, the scale of the of the uh, bronze work in the lobby, it's much more delicate. So even if if the design were totally modern and different, I think there's an aspect of scale and texture that's missing from the bronze. The bronze is a kind of a look at me material. It's a, it's, a, it's a bright detail in a dark space. And I think that's okay, but it's gotta have more scale and the finish has should, like everyone is saying, match the rest of the bronze. Um, on the other hand, I think Fred's idea of the black is is a is the opposite direction. It's something where you really aren't going to see it. It's going to fade into the darkness. It's going to be kind of this monolithic, very modern black void. And I think that that would be okay too. You could also do something that was very light and glass that would also disappear. Uh, so I think the the applicant has lots of options, um, any of which could be okay. I th but I think everyone's finding this desk design a bit. Uh, problematic, and I would share that concern, but I think they could go either way. Commissioner Chapin. 
Uh, Sarah? Yes. You, were you asking me to go next? Yes, to go next. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm very happy to see uh, moving uh, the uh, entryway here because uh, the applicant referred to it looking like a brick uh, cave as someone who used to work at 40 Hudson and occasionally got to, to see a little bit of this. We always thought of it as a temple to the bricklayer's art. It's, it's just such a beautiful, uh, warm, glowing space. There isn't a lot of light in it, but it's, it's a terrific uh, uh, landmark. In any event, uh, I agree with the other commissioners uh, that the materials and the design don't seem to be uh, working uh, exactly here. There's so many suggestions. I don't want to opine on I'm, a couple of them. I thought I, also I could see using something like a black, but I could also see trying to just do something that is a little more compatible uh, visually uh, with the space. It is, a, you know, it's a much larger element because the way you're going to see it, I think, than the uh, turnstiles. So it is important uh, that it really uh, fits the space. And right now it just doesn't, uh, it hasn't quite got there. So it needs some uh, reworking. Okay. All right. So I think while there have been some suggestions of other materials and finishes, the proposal before us today is for this particular brass finish in this faceted design. And it does seem like while there may be six commissioners who support a bronze finish that would relate to the bronze in the, in the uh, interior space, that um, that bronze uh, does need to be a cast, on the desk anyway, needs to be a cast material and I think needs to have more texture and scale. Um, and maybe the base material should also be rethought. So. Um, George, you're welcome to, uh, we won't take an action today. I think we have some pretty specific comments about how the bronze desk could work and be found appropriate in this space. If you wanted to explore other alternatives, that's entirely up to you. But I think with um, a, a cast material and some detailing and texture that give it a different scale and texture uh, that relates more to the bronze detailing in the space, you, you could come back and get an approval. So. Um, Commissioner Bland, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. go ahead. And actually raising my hand. Um, I just wanted to um, remind everybody uh, and mostly George, that if bronze <laughs> is to be bronze, there are many finishes of bronze, including something very, very dark. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could stay with bronze and look to something darker than this bright, bright, uh, shiny bronze. Anyway, just a thought and a comment. Yep. <clears throat> So uh, again, I think that if we look at, <clears throat> you know, the refining the bronze to better relate to the space, I think that we will have enough to support the proposal. So we'll take no action and George will let you work on this, um, continue to think about it and talk to the staff and we'll have you back as soon as we can. Okay, we're gonna move to item number five. This is LPC 20-02819, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 607, lot 7503, 15 7th Avenue in the Greenwich Village Historic District. A hospital building designed by Eggers and Higgins and built in 1950. The application is to legalize the installation of signage and a flagpole installed without LPC permits. And commissioners, the applicant has joined the meeting. And if you could just state your name for the record and then you may begin. Thank you. Okay, uh, Frank Kim for Council Design. The application here is for the legalization of two signs and uh, that were installed on West 12th Street and the legalization um, of a corner flagpole uh, with, um, uh, with uh, the bracket. Uh, slide. 
Okay, this is uh, the existing condition as it, as it stands today. Uh, you can see on, on the left side is the West 12th Street, the two signs. And on the right side is the signs on 7th Avenue. The signs on 7th Avenue will be approved on the staff level. Um, on this building uh, was converted to a residential building from a hospital. And the first floor uh, is a currently a commercial space as converted. The first six bay windows that are uh, from the corner to the left are the depth of the commercial space. Uh, hence the signs being installed on the second and fourth uh, uh, windows. Uh, this slide here shows uh, a street view from Google from circa 2009, and it shows that there used to be an existing sign uh, for St. Vincent's Hospital. And that's uh, uh, where we think why the signs on West 12 uh, would be appropriate. Uh, also, this would show uh, the flags uh, that were on top of the entrance of um, the hospital. Um, so uh, saying that there used to be flags in the building. The next slide shows a close-up view. Uh, the top view is the West 12th Street and the bottom is the 7th Avenue. The, the building is located at the uh, north edge of the district. Uh, it's cornered by 7th Avenue and West 12th. Uh, this uh, elevation showing the location and the size um, and materials uh, of the sign uh, and the flagpole. Uh, the signs, uh, the, the next slide would show the actual dimensions of the signs. Uh, it's a seven and a half inch, um, quarter inch aluminum laser cut um, black finish and is uh, adhered to the stone via a, a glue type that we have confirmed with the manufacturer that once the signs are removed, the glue can be easily removed without damaging the stone. Uh, this shows the, uh, the flagpole that was installed. Uh, the flagpole uh, was drilled into the, the, the stone corners and the dimensions of the flagpole are uh, 31 inches wide. And I, I believe... Uh, by 48 inches tall. Um, they have the same uh, similar, uh, they're the same wording as the sign is for a small door uh, veterinary and uh, is uh, also the same color as the sign, which is black, but you know, for contrast, uh, white lettering. Uh, this just shows a, a couple of views uh, of the sign from the sidewalks and uh, I believe uh, the one on the I want to do the sixth uh, picture uh, shows uh, the flag being very small at the corner, and that that will conclude the presentation. Okay, thank you. So, commissioners, just to clarify, the applicant stated that the signs on Seventh Avenue were being approved at staff level, and I just wanted to explain that because. There may be some confusion since they look the same. So the, the rules, as you may know, allow the staff to approve signage above storefronts. And the openings on 7th Avenue are storefront openings, whereas the openings on 12th Street are you know, regular double hung windows or multi-light windows. So that is how um, the two facades have been distinguished. And that is why the signs on 7th Avenue are being approved pursuant to the rules because they're above storefronts and the signs on East 12th Street don't fit into the rules because we don't have a rule for signage over um, non-storefront openings. And then uh, the bracket sign, the, the flagpole doesn't meet the bracket sign rules or any other rule in addition. So are there any questions for the applicant or for the staff, Commissioner Devonshire? I have a question about uh, the adhesive. Uh, do we know what the what type of adhesive it is, and what yeah, type the, of stone is it? Is it limestone? Uh, uh, right now, I believe it is limestone. Yes. And and what's the uh, what are the properties of the adhesive? 
Uh, I have submitted a, a spec sheet to the staff. Um, but I don't have them with me right now. Did you see it, Corey? I did not myself, but I believe the preservationist is in the meeting and could potentially answer that question. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, are you available? Hi. Um, yes, so I recall um, seeing the spec sheet. I don't have it pulled up in front of me, um, but I do, as the applicant noted, um, that's something that could be removed. Um, although we would request that the applicant work with staff um, to make sure that that is the case if the signs are removed. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi. <laughs> I have a question about um, 7th Avenue. Uh, is that by the front door just to the left of it? Is that a little blade sign sticking out from the? Yes, and can we maybe go to the slide that shows a photograph of 7th Avenue? I'm trying to. Okay, so yes, if you look at the bottom photograph right adjacent to the door is a bracket sign that is also, um, in, that complies with our rules. Got it. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Any other? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised, so we'll turn to public testimony. Oh, wait, I have one more question, Commissioner Goldblum. I'm trying to unmute you. There we go. I live across the street from this uh, site. And so um, I just was wondering why it's, why the applicant thinks it's okay put retail signage on the street side. Why, you know, there, my recollection is that across the street, there's like a, a pharmacy and the subway entrance, but that it doesn't have any entrances from the street side, it's all from the avenue, and that the, uh, uh, the signage is also facing the street, not the avenue. And the rest of the block is, if I'm not mistaken, residential. Uh, so what, why is it a good, Help us understand why it's a good idea to put uh, retail signage on the side street. Well, the, the whole idea of putting retail signage on the side street is because uh, for, uh, of course, to advertise that the business is there. And also uh, it's um, because that whole, uh, um, for lack of a better word, uh, that whole facade that is being used for commercial space um, is uh, it's commercial space, it's not residential space. Uh, and it, it also, you know, uh, catches the view of, uh, adver of course, advertising and saying that business is there from 7th Avenue, uh, coming from the other end of West 12. Um, and the, the sign is, um, uh, I, I believe it's like a small and, you know, elegant enough. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's take testimony. Lisa, do we have anyone who is waiting to speak on this item? Um, we did not have anybody that signed up to speak. Um, we do have one person in the room, um, so I think I will try to admit them. Admin, um, you are you here to testify for 15 7th Avenue? Admin? Admin, uh, last chance. Okay, um, I'm not sure who this is, but I think that that's all we have. Okay, all right. Um, and Rich, do we have a resolution from the community board? There we go. Uh, we do have a resolution from Manhattan CB2, uh, a partial approval and denial approval of the two signs in the 12th Street facade and denial of the flagpole. So approval of the signage on 12th Street and denial of the flagpole. Okay. All right. All right. Are there any final questions for the applicant? No. And Mr. Kim, are there any final comments you'd like to make before we move into our discussion? No. Okay. So let's 
Um, move to closing the hearing. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close the hearing. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed. So um, let's move into our discussion. And as I, um, as I mentioned, the signs on 7th Avenue, the two surface mounted signs and the blade sign are um, approved pursuant to our rules that allow signage next to and on above storefronts. So we're looking at the two signs on 12th Street that are applied in the same manner as those on uh, 7th Avenue. And then, th and then this little um, flagpole and banner on the corner. So in total, three signs, two signs and a flagpole. Um, let me see. My, uh, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this? Sure. Um, first, um, I've had a, a relatively long history of working with stone. I know no adhesive that can be applied to limestone that isn't going to leave residue that's going to be removed probably with uh, abrasive blasting. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of put off by that. Um, in any case, I think that on the street side, it should be gone and I'm not in favor of the flagpole. Okay, Commissioner Chen. I, uh, I have uh, no problem with the sign on the 12th Street side. Uh, I will leave it to the majority uh, as to the flagpole. My own observation is that this is a rather very regularly patterned uh, street. So to me, that's almost like a little decorative element provided it does not uh, do damage to the stone. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Um, I don't think the flag is appropriate. I would remove it. And I don't think that uh, lettering above the windows, not even a door, you can't go in. So uh, it's just advertising on a very residential street. I would think that's inappropriate too. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I agree about the flagpole, but I, I just had a thought about the signage. I actually don't think the way the signage is done on 12th Street makes sense, but um, in listening to the applicant, I can appreciate the fact that ideally you would like to pe have people know that they are, that this, your business exists or the business exists. So how about if there is on the window at the, at the corner, um, as you make the turn, you had that one window with signage so that you would almost have an every other window effect from um, 7th Avenue around and then it just stops there. That would be my recommendation. Otherwise, I would say no to 12th Street because I think it moves too far down the block. Okay. All right, so, and no to the flagpole and you could have put one sign at the first window bay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner uh, Jefferson. Uh, yes, the flagpole in a corner, no, uh, no flagpole. And the signage on 12th Street, also no. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson? Uh, same here, no flagpole, no signs on the street side. Okay. Commissioner Shamir Barron? I'm in agreement with that too, no flagpole, no signage on 12th Street in the way that it appears now. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Holford-Smith? I agree with that. Okay, Commissioner Chapin? Uh, the flagpole is inappropriate. Um, I, I would be okay with one sign on the 12th, uh, 12th Street side because uh, of the symmetry with what's going on on the other street, but certainly not more than one. Okay, and Commissioner Goldblum? No sign, no flag. Sorry, one sign, did you say? No sign, no flag. No sign, no flag. Two, three, four, five. 
Okay, so I I act, uh, would have supported one sign on 12th Street at the corner. I do recognize that this is a residential street, but also think that there is some um, precedent along 7th Avenue to have one sign wrap the corner and sort of mark the corner uh, and no to the flagpole. It's neither a black bracket sign nor a flagpole in, in an, an atypical location. Um, but since we don't have support for signs at all on 12th Street, it seems like we have one more than six to deny the proposal. And um, I will, I think, because it requires some um, editing here, I'll go ahead and make the motion and then we'll call the vote, Rich, okay? So, um, in the matter of uh, 15 7th Avenue, Greenwich Village Historic District, docket number LPC 20-02819, a hospital building designed by Eggers and Higgins and built in 1950. This is an application to legalize the installation of signage and a flagpole installed without Landmarks Preservation Commission permits. And I note that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I further note that the building was recently converted from a hospital to a residential use with a commercial ground floor. And I recommend denial finding that flagpoles and banners are not typical signage found on buildings in, of this type in this historic district, and that this particular banner and flagpole may not meet zoning requirements. And I also find that two signs on the West 12th Street elevation will be at odds or in contrast with the residential character of 12th Street and um, therefore recommend denial. Rich, will you call the vote? Yes. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. I love it in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that is denied. And Mr. Kim, you can continue to work with the staff on options for your, your client. Corey, we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is number six, LPC 20-07589, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1128, lot 33. 160 Central Park West, AKA 2 West 76th Street and the Central Park West, West 76th Street Historic District. An English Gothic style church building designed by William Appleton Potter and built in 1897 to 98. The application is to alter the areaway and install a barrier free access ramp. And commissioners were waiting on the applicant. Is the applicant um, present or, or and just connecting or have we do we not know if the applicant is not present? I, there may I, have been a connection problem. We're, we're trying to uh, check that out at the moment. Okay. Hi, commissioners, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe the architect is on the meeting but is, uh, un, had difficulty renaming himself and is admin. Okay, we'll let admin in. Tom, are you still there? Okay, commissioners, the applicant has joined the meeting. And applicant, if you can just state your name for the record, and then you may begin. If the applicant could just click the screen and introduce yourself. Uh, 
or if you wish to just speak, then I can advance the slides for you if you could just verbally acknowledge that. Okay, he doesn't appear to be muted, but I don't think we can hear, I see him talking and we can't hear him. So I don't know if there's a volume issue on his end. It, it looks to me that this person doesn't have a microphone. Oh. So they might not be able to speak at all. Okay, so um, I wonder if um, James can do this presentation for the applicant. Okay, I will. James, you're muted. If you are able to uh, unmute yourself and start with the slides, we'll see if we can get the speaker and I'll just continue, okay? Great, thank you. Good, af good afternoon, commissioners, James Russell, LPC staff. I'm just uh, going to present the item before you uh, on behalf of for Tom Fenneman, who's online, but has some issues with the audio. Let me just, okay. Okay, the item before you is the Fourth Universalist Church built in the late 19th century by William Appleton Potter. And we're just gonna go through some historic images. This is a image of the historic interior uh, where there was a carved limestone uh, area in the chancel area. It was a Universalist Church, so I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, that was previously removed and is stored in the uh, basement right now. This is the Central Park West entry. Um, there, it has three main entrance doors on Central Park West. They all lead into a lobby vestibule narthex. Um, this one is the southernmost entrance next to the nearby apartment house. You can see that areaway, a sunken areaway with a, a little barrier there. And adjacent to this entry, um, you can see a, a cast iron vault light panel that is somewhat atypical, and we will just go through that. Here is the uh, sidewalk slopes downward at this area. So the southernmost entry is the um, area that's closest to the sidewalk. Um, the northernmost entry has more steps. We'll continue. This is the side um, West 76th Street facade. Here are some of those uh, panels that you saw on the interior historic photo that, was that were discovered recently uh, in the basement. Let's see. And here are some of those panels that have been reassembled um, in the church. And I'm sorry, I'm not doing this as a, well. So here we go is the, um, sorry, this is the vault lights, the historic vault lights that are there that are adjacent to the southernmost entry on Central Park West. You can see that the vault lights that are there are in a dilapidated condition. And this is the plan of the um, Fourth Universalist Church. So currently the proposal is to uh, install a barrier-free access, which we could do at staff level. This is a historic district. However, it is to partially remove and to restore some of those vault lights and to put in a, a decorative stone barrier, reusing those stones from the interior of the facade. And here you see it at the southernmost entry of Central Park West. Other areas that were considered were the northernmost entry at Central Park West, which would require a longer ramp that would have to loop around the corner and a uh, staggered dog leg type configuration at the West 76th Street entry. Here you see a rendering. 
and with the proposed uh, barrier free access. And we're just gonna go in for a, a better detail. So here's the vault lights that you saw in photos. And here's the proposed ramp. Here's the decorative stone areaway. Uh, decorative stone that's being reused to create a barrier. And here's the ramp and this is a section cut through it. They will only be putting in uh, handrails on the outside, uh, on the inside where they are kind of reusing some of the cast iron vaults. And they will also be re relocating a standing pipe to vent naturally at the inboard side of the ramp. And that is the presentation. And okay. let's just see if uh, Tom can join by audio. I'm sorry, Tom, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, and we have a question. So this is great if Mr. Fenneman can hear and answer the question. Commissioner Goldblum, go ahead. Uh, why, did, why did you dismiss the dog leg version on the side street? Okay, the question from Commissioner Goldblum is why did you dismiss the dog leg um, ramp on West 76th Street? I'm just going to go back to that plan, and there we go. Well, I want to bring them back into the kind of the back of the house. It's not the primary entrance. Uh, the primary entrance where the office is located is on Central Park West, and that entrance would bring you in to the narthex where traditionally you would be entering the church. Uh, it also chunks out a large piece of the green space that they have where they have some partial landscaping and garden area in that uh, side yard. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, commissioners, were you able to hear that answer? Yes. Okay. C Commissioner Goldblum, did you hear the answer and did it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Not seeing any hands raised, we'll go to um, public testimony. Lisa, is there anyone who'd like to speak on this application? Yes, we did have two people sign up. I'm going to start with Kelly Carroll from HDC. Okay, Kelly, you should be unmuted. HDC begins by disclosing that the architect for the applicant, Tom Fenneman, is on our board of directors and advisors, and that he remotely presented this proposal to our public review committee. Our committee, uh, our committee discussed the proposal after Mr. Fenneman exited the call, and we do support this proposal. We found the proposed ramp to be an imagine, imaginative use of salvage materials. The carved stone that was long forgotten inside the church will have a new life on the exterior and the ramp incorporates the vault lights that will be sacrificed, sacrificed to construct it. In the universe of ramps that we've reviewed, this is definitely a creative standout. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Next, I'm going to bring in Sean Sandy from Landmark West. Sean, we brought you into the room and I've unmuted you. And, and I Sean, think you might need to turn off your YouTube volume, Sean. Yes. From Landmark West. Yes. Great. And then if you could um, state your name for the record, and then you have three minutes. I muted you. But you still need to mute your yeah YouTube. I believe I did. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. Again, full disclosure, Landmark West is and has been in a long-term relationship with the Fourth Universalist Society for some time now. Most recently as fiscal sponsors for a much anticipated slate roof and formerly in partnership with the community through Seoul, Save Our Universalist Landmark, uniting neighbors, congregants and church leadership in 1985 during the nascent days of Landmark West itself. Fourth U served as a witness on January 12th and 13th, 1988 when the Landmarks Commission brought the party to the Upper West Side for a legendary 15 hour hearing that began at 1030 in the morning on the 12th and adjourned at 117 the next day for the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. It continues to serve an integral role in our own history. 
With this in mind, the Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee supports accessibility to our landmarks in order to make them available to all New Yorkers. The Landmark West C of A Committee was surprised by this unexpected but inventive proposal. Reincorporating donor tissue from the same host and autographed, which is often the best match. That said, the committee questioned origins. Is this Ambo stone the work of William Appleton Parler or part of the Lewis Comfort Tiffany altar? <laughs> Is the stone finish similar to the facade or might the carved quatrefoils weather differently when outside? Further questions remain about dimension. Could this incline rise ideally be achieved in one continuous run parallel to the facade without the initial threshold which runs perpendicular? And lastly, concerning the sidewalk faults which we are very protective of, the new application seems to be an unorthodox integration and unlikely to provide much light if any to those below. This might be better served as a weeping limestone capstone. Ultimately, the proposed changes do not compete with the underlying structure and do not obscure any defining features. The society has a long running history of thinking differently and doing right by the community, whether their immediate neighbors or the city at large, and this ramp will allow them to serve both more readily. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee supports approval of this application. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. And we do have another person in the waiting room, um, Will Ashley, that I will bring in. Okay, Will, can you hear me? Will, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, are you here to testify for 160 Central Park West? Yes. Great. So if you could just state your name for the record and then you have three minutes. I, I can hear you, yes. So, so Will, can you, I think you might need to turn off your YouTube sound. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Ashley. I am speaking on behalf of Fourth Universalist in favor of the ramp. Um, my wife and I joined Fourth Universalists in 2010, and I um, came onto the board in uh, 2013, and since 2017 have served as board president. During all that time, um, the ramp has been the ramp and the lack of it has been an issue. Um, I've attended a number of meetings and heard from a number of people in the congregation at annual meetings about this, and. Um, I just want to applaud uh, Tom Penman's design because it does use original stonework um, from the building. I think it would be a beautiful addition to Central Park West. I also want to speak specifically on the point of that it provides the entrance um, for people that need the ramp to the same narthex that other people enter the building on. So on Sunday morning, they would be greeted by the senior minister in the same flow of people and welcomed into the building and the community uh, and the service in the same way. And that's, that's important both to the people that use the ramp and to um, the rest of the congregation and community. So I, I really think this is a, a beautiful design that would be a mutual benefit to um, our community and the surrounding community. And I uh, appreciate the commission's consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, that's everybody um, that signed up or is in the waiting room to speak. Okay, thank you. And Rich, do we have any written testimony? Yes, we do. We have a letter of support uh, from a neighboring uh, apartment complex uh, stating their approval and a resolution from Community Board 7 also recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Fenneman, uh, is there any final, are there any final comments you'd like to make before we move to our discussion? Okay, Tom, um, they're, they're asking if you want to comment on any of the information that was brought up. Well, I, I could just add that the fabric, the, the limestone pieces that we'd be reusing are clearly part of the Potter language uh, and design. The Tiffany uh, altar is very much different language than the stones that we're using. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any final questions? Okay, so not seeing any hands raised, I'm gonna suggest that we move to close the hearing. Commissioner Gustafson, will you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. 
And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> okay, hearing is closed. So um, this is, uh, I, I'm sorry, the applicant had some audio problems, but I, James did a very, um, I think, clear and understandable presentation and explained two other alternatives that were explored. And this definitely seems to be the location that gives entrance, uh, barrier-free access to a primary entrance and um, has the sort of the smallest length of ramp that would be required and um, is using material from the building that relates to the vocabulary of the original design. So I could support this. And um, Commissioner Bland, do you have any thoughts on this? I have the same thought that you do. I think this is a, a felicitous, uh, for once, a felicitous um, uh, way of, of providing access into a historic building. So I okay. think it's very appropriate, yes. Great, Commissioner Lutfi? I agree, I think it's well done and using the salvage material is terrific. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum, I know you had a question about the other location for a ramp. I think the location is good. My, my only, I share uh, Sean's concern about the materiality and, and whether it's okay outside, but I think it's willing, I, I'd be willing to approve it and see how it goes. Prove it. Okay, as is. Okay, um, does anyone disagree? Just in the interest of time, if if um, you're not comfortable with the proposal as presented, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay, I think we may be um, at a place where we will have consensus for support. So I'm gonna ask Commissioner Chapin, would you make this motion? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> In the matter of a certificate of appropriateness, Borough of Manhattan, LPC 2075891060 Central Park West, AKA 2 West 76th Street, Central Park West, West 76th Street Historic District. An English Gothic style church building designed by William Appleton Porter and built in 1897 to 1898. Application is to alter the area way and install a barrier free access ramp. I note that the building style scale materials <clears throat> and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Central Park West, West 76th Street Historic District and the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the work will pr provide barrier free access to the main building entrance in the least intrusive manner possible. That vault lights are an atypical feature of this building type and within the historic district. And therefore the partial removal will not detract from the special architectural character of the building or streetscape. That the new ramp will align with the adjacent area way of the neighboring building to the south and that the ramp and the extended landing will sit well within the area way of the church without disturbing the architectural features of the building's base, that a small area of vault lights will be retained and incorporated into the design, that the materials of the ramp, including concrete, limestone, and simple painted steel railings will harmonize with the facade, and that installation will be used as salvage section of an interior low limestone wall, which matches the facade in terms of materials, style, and details. Okay, Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, sorry, Rich is gonna call the roll, but before we do that, I do see Commissioner Jefferson has his hand up. Did you wanna add something, Commissioner Jefferson? I, I, had, I had a question about how you could incorporate the vault lights, but indeed it was part of the solution, so it's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rich, will you call the vote? Yes. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Samir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Mr. Goldblum? Aye. Mr. Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford-Smith? 
Aye. Right, 11 in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you, Mr. Fenneman. And uh, Corey, we'll move to the next three items, I believe, right? The commission. Yes, the, uh, the next three and last three items of the day all involve Rockefeller Center. Uh, there are a few related elements, but they are individual applications. So I will read each one in separately and we'll take uh, action on each one separately. So going to item seven, this is LPC 20-07949, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, uh, multiple blocks and lots. 610 Fifth Avenue, 620 Fifth Avenue, 626 Fifth Avenue, 630 Fifth Avenue, 636 Fifth Avenue, 1 Rockefeller Plaza, and 30 Rockefeller Plaza, all part of the Rockefeller Center individual landmark. Seven office buildings, including the British Building, La Maison Francaise, Palazzo d'Italia, International Building, International Building North, 1 Rockefeller Plaza Building, an RCA building designed by a consortium of architects known as the Associated Architects with portions designed by a group of fine artists from 1932 to 34 and 1936 to 38 as parts of an Art Deco style office commercial entertainment complex. Uh, this application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of storefronts and signage. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the meeting and okay. now have the presentation and you may begin. Okay, but wait, I think we have to read in other, uh, to the two others, Corey, or are we reading uh, all I was going to wait to do those separately since they okay. are individual applications. We'll take a vote after each. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you all. Uh, this is Cass Stackelberg of Higgins, Quays, Barth and Partners, uh, and I'm joined virtually by E.B. Kelly of Tishman Spire and Michael Gabellini of Gabellini Shepherd Architects. Um, it's good to see you all again. Um, uh, as Corey mentioned, there are actually three applications um, that we're going to be sharing with you. We're going to get to spend the rest of the afternoon together. We're going to try and be um, quick about these presentations. Um, but I do want to just uh, by way of introduction, um, mention that the first two, um, this one, which is an expansion of an existing master plan, and the second one, which focuses on three very specific um, locations within the center um, and, and includes modifications to um, existing storefronts are really focused on um, the ground plane uh, and the, that sort of public retail commercial zone of Rockefeller Center. And the changes that we're going to share with you um, have come about um, because of the changes in the retail landscape. Um, these are changes that were very apparent, obviously, before COVID. Um, they will be even more pronounced, perhaps, uh, when we are all happily back at work. Um, but that is the sort of um, genesis of these applications looking at ways um, to allow for flexibility uh, within the storefronts, uh, but to do it in a, in a sensitive manner. And um, before I begin and get into the details, I do also wanna just acknowledge um, Commissioner Gustafson's comments at the end of the hearing last week, because I think they were actually um, very, uh, very clear. And I, I want um, sort of just to touch on them in particular two points that I think he made, this sort of uh, importance of balance uh, and the balance between uh, beauty and functionality. And um, I would expand that into sort of preservation and appropriate change. I think this balance is something that this team, Tishman Spire, Higgins Quaysbarth, Gabby Shepard, um, thinks quite a lot about. Uh, and we are hopeful that uh, you will uh, find that we have struck just the right balance uh, in these proposals that we're going to share with you uh, today. Um, so the, the first um, application that we're going to look at uh, is focused on uh, the storefronts uh, in a select number of buildings. If I could just get this to advance, great. So um, a site plan here um, as, a, as a way of introduction. Um, up in the upper right corner, this is 45 Rockefeller Plaza, and this is a, a, a general site plan of the, the main complex. Um, in 1998, there was a storefront master plan that was approved for um, 30, uh, 31 storefronts uh, with an addition of four in here, so 30, uh, 34, 35 storefronts along the 51st Street Rockefeller Plaza, 50th Street, and Atlas Court facades. And this was approved um, under commission review uh, and allowed for a series of different changes uh, to the storefronts uh, at this building. It allowed for uh, eight different storefronts. And, and what this application is about here today is actually taking, um, taking that master plan and actually expanding it to these other buildings that are highlighted, 610 and 625th, uh, one Rockefeller Plaza, 
and 30 Rockefeller Plaza with its uh, sister building at 1256th Avenue. Um, all of these buildings, uh, and you can see by the dates on the site plan, all of these buildings uh, were built within five years of one another. They all have very similar uh, storefront components. Um, and we think it's a, a, an appropriate thing to take uh, the sort of the DNA from the 45 Rock master plan and apply it to the other, uh, to the other buildings that are uh, similar in their storefront detailing. Um, there are a few variations and I'll just point them out um, in plan and we'll look at those in particular instead of going through all the detail because there is some repetition as you might understand. Um, also in 1998, there were uh, approvals for modifying these storefronts on the Fifth Avenue frontages of 636, 630, 620, and 610 Fifth Avenue. Um, we are looking to include those storefronts um, as well in this master plan. And also uh, variations along the west elevations of 620 and 6, uh, 610 Fifth where elevational changes change the, the proportions. Uh, but as you'll see in the details, the idea is to maintain uh, the same organization and the same component part <coughs> um, of our proposal. Um, a few slides from the uh, Buyer Blender Bell pre uh, Master Plan that was approved in 1998. Uh, again, the various um, bays that were included in the Master Plan, um, and then details uh, of the various types that were approved. As I mentioned, there were eight different types that were included. I'll just point this out. This was, uh, for some reason, not actually included in the approved Master Plan. Uh, it allows for a, um, a, a recessed door and a code compliant ADA compliance sidelight, which um, we would like to actually add into, uh, into the uh, list of um, approved storefront configurations. And then the second page, so these are some additional uh, types that were included in the approved master plan. So we are looking to build off of this and apply these configurations to the other buildings. Um, this is a matrix of our, um, of, uh, our proposed type. So across Across the top, and you can see the older drawings are actually from the Bayer Blender Bell scheme. Um, this is that one uh, storefront type A with a recessed door and a code compliant uh, 18 inch side light. We'd like to include that. Um, these four types occur only on Fifth Avenue. And then these four types occur only on um, the west elevations of 610, 620 where the heights of the buildings um, are such and the storefronts are such that you have a sort of more attenuated reading, but conceptually there is a similarity and I'll just sort of draw your attention to the sort of vertical orientation of the matrix. So um, here you have a centered door with a side light, either as a typical storefront, uh, one on Fifth Avenue or, um, or one of these taller bays, uh, a door flush right uh, or a mirror flush left, uh, a tall window, a uh, single light window, and then um, drawing on this model, a double door recessed um, at the center of the bays. Um, so the idea is to um, basically work off of the approved configurations and apply it to the conditions um, at the other buildings. Um, historically, I'll just sort of share a few historic images just to give you a sense of the sort of component parts. This is an early photo from the 1930s um, across Channel Gardens. This is the north elevation of 610 Sixth Avenue. So uh, typically you had a dark statuary bronze storefront frame, uh, a, a back painted uh, spandrel glass with signage applied to the glass, uh, retractable awnings uh, integrated into uh, the storefront system, uh, show windows, and typically uh, recessed doors. Uh, interestingly, all of these uh, bays were originally constructed with doors before they were tenanted. And the idea was that uh, uh, likely that there would be very small shops, um, understandably in the, in the 1930s. Uh, interestingly, we are returning to that condition, and that's really in large part what brings about the need for the master plan. Um, but just recessed doors, uh, granite bulkhead, and uh, and bronze uh, bronze framing and bronze doors. Um, a few other images, um, just to point out also how these changes to the storefronts occurred actually very early and obviously continue into the 20th century, through the 20th century, and even into the 21st. So again, a photo from the 1930s. This is the west elevation of 620 and the west elevation of 610 Fifth Avenue with Channel Gardens sloping down. So you can see this pronounced grade change from here on Fifth Avenue where we have much shorter storefronts to quite tall storefronts here uh, at the corners and on the west elevations. But I'll also just draw your attention to the configuration where you had vertical mullions in these historic storefronts 
And then um, by the 19, late 1930s on the photos on the bottom, you can see how horizontal mullions have been introduced as the space became tenanted. So as, as the spaces became tenanted as early as the late 1930s, there are already changes occurring to the configuration of these storefronts. Um, turning to Fifth Avenue, this was the condition uh, originally in the 1930s into the 50s and even into designation. You had the low storefronts um, on, the, on the side elevations as well as on the Fifth Avenue elevations. Uh, and that was modified as part of a commission approval uh, to raise the storefronts one um, stone course uh, and to come up with a slightly different configuration. So turning to the current conditions, um, what we have on Fifth Avenue today is what was approved um, approximately 20 years ago. So these taller storefronts with pin mounted letters um, on, on the limestone, this occurs only at eight bays, the eight storefront bays that face directly onto Fifth Avenue. Um, these bays, as you can see in these photos, uh, do not include any doors. So turning toward the, the key plan here, what you have is store entries just at the, at the center point. So here, um, at each of these, but there are no doors on either side or on these um, uh, on some of these side streets. So what we're looking at is the opportunity um, as some of these large retail spaces will likely be leased to smaller, uh, smaller tenants. Uh, we're looking for the opportunity to introduce doors into these storefronts. And that's largely what is driving uh, this master plan is the idea of being able to integrate doors uh, into windows and vice versa to allow for changes. So looking at our proposed conditions. So again, here, this is uh, 610 and 625th Avenue. The existing condition occurs across the top um, and across the bottom. Um, these are our four proposed conditions. So one could have a center door, flush right or flush right left, or a paired door at the center. Uh, and this continues uh, across all of the Fifth Avenue elevations. So here you can see uh, 45 Rockefeller Plaza, the existing conditions. Um, uh, the existing elevation, and then our four, uh, our four types that we would uh, allow for <coughs> across these, these elevations. Um, moving off of uh, the Fifth Avenue facades, um, just again, sort of the typical uh, photos of, of the elevations of 45 Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, again, the existing elevations, these are the, um, the, 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 um, the various types that we would uh, propose for infill. This includes all of the previously approved as well as the one type that was left out of the 1998 master plan. We'd like to include that. So for all of these three elevations as well as the Atlas Court elevations distinct from the Fifth Avenue elevations. Um, I'm gonna continue, this is the Rockefeller Plaza elevation. I'm gonna continue um, to uh, 610 and 620 because obviously there is quite a bit of repetition. The idea is to use the same configurations uh, throughout uh, throughout the buildings that would now fall under the expanded master plan. I'm happy to come back to any of these. I just am mindful of time. Um, these, of course, elevations within, um, within Channel Gardens on the north and south sides of 610, 620. You can see the component parts. I'll also just point out that over time there have been changes. Um, the introduction of mullions changing out of doors. Historically, these doors would have been a light statuary bronze to contrast with the dark statuary bronze frame. Uh, our master plan proposes to uh, reinstate the statuary bronze doors in all of the bays. Um, typical elevations at 620 um, and, uh, and 610. Um, and then turning to uh, the west elevations of 620 and 610. So you can see on the west side, uh, th these storefronts, these two have uh, vertical and horizontal mullions, uh, while on the east side at 610, these windows are clear glass. Um, so, um, you know, as with any, any master plan, the goal is to, to move toward uni, uh, uh, uniformity. So uh, again, these are the west elevations and, and the two bays around the corner, which are also quite tall. Uh, these are the existing elevations. So the west side at 620 um, have horizontal and vertical mullions, which create these sort of awkward conditions. The um, east side at 610 uh, has large windows, uh, large plate glass windows. Our proposal is to allow for um, only large plate glass windows or doors of the center, flush left, uh, or, or paired doors. Uh, again, with just the vertical mullions um, to, uh, to, frame, to frame the entries. Uh, the side uh, windows as well, uh, single, single glazed on, on the south 
and Mullions on the um, on the north. Again, like the current proposal or current approval for 45, we would propose just a single glazed window uh, for for future changes for these windows. Um, these are elevations for one Rockefeller Plaza. Um, existing photos to see uh, existing conditions there. Um, existing elevations, and again, the, the range of, of types that are limited um, to these four types. Um, and then 30 Rockefeller Plaza, again, similar conditions here, um, changes over time, but you, you see the various component parts uh, of these storefronts, the uh, lighter statuary bronze uh, doors in various uh, scales and configurations and the dark statuary bronze framing uh, and signage above. Um, similar uh, range of, of options. Uh, we try and limit the number of options based on the, uh, the site conditions. Um, and, and finally, looking at um, the back on 6th Avenue, 1250 Avenue Americas, similar configurations, but the finish of these storefronts uh, historically were always the light statuary, so you don't have the contrast between the framing and the doors. Uh, we would maintain that, but also allow for uh, variability in the configurations. As you can see, these have changed uh, a bit over time. Uh, the last component, while well, I have a series of, of uh, storefront details, these represent details for the typical storefronts with the sign band, the granite base, the storefront framing, um, the Fifth Avenue storefronts with the pin mounted letters on the limestone above. And the idea is to just replicate these details and integrate um, the doors and the mullions as required. Um, happy to come back to these details, commissioners, if you all have questions. Um, variations between the Fifth Avenue details uh, and some of the details at 30 Rock relative to the other buildings. Um, a plan section just illustrating the recesses that we would be incorporating into the door bays. Um, I want to just point this out uh, and stop here for a minute. This is uh, an existing elevation of a typical um, door. Uh, we're proposing to um, make the styles and rails slightly uh, narrower, bottom rail still heavier than the top and uh, top rail and side rails. And there are a few reasons we're proposing. <clears throat> One is, is that many of these storefronts are actually quite um, short. And there's always a desire to have more daylighting and more transparency. So we're proposing slightly um, thinner uh, framing members. Um, we're also proposing um, pivot uh, balance doors because these, these doors are actually quite heavy to operate. So between um, lightening up the frames, which obviously will lighten the visual effect of the doors, but also changing the operation so that they are pivot doors that will actually help in, um, in the, in the um, actual getting in and operating, uh, operating these doors. Um, the other component um, of this, the, the store from master plan proposal actually deals with signage. Uh, this is a key plan that just highlights uh, the storefronts with this typical signage that we've been looking at, the sort of sign band with, um, with um, dimensional letters adhered onto the glass. And one of the issues that we wanted to address as part of this application was that during the day, the contrast between the light statuary bronze letters and the dark spandrel glass is very apparent. But interestingly, in the evenings, whether you're on, on the same side of the street or even across the street um, from, let's say, late October into early March, um, you can't read the signage uh, in the sign bands at all. There, there's no signage uh, on the windows. It's exclusively on these sign bands. So being sure that that signage is visible uh, in, the, in the winter months is actually very important. So the team has developed a, a simple um, lighting design. Um, these are some other examples. Uh, this is the Empire State Building. Uh, slightly different treatment here, but these are uh, lit letters, um, the individually lit. Um, and then also at uh, Bergdorf Goodman, there's also a, a, a halo lit letter here. Um, our treatment is perhaps a little simpler. Uh, it's a very narrow external light. Uh, this is an existing elevation and an existing section showing the um, typical uh, bronze letter adhered to the glass. And our proposal simply is to modify the way the letters are done so that there's a, a bronze letter with a thin uh, acrylic backing. Uh, and then this very shallow uh, light shelf here, this measures, um, as you can see, 13 and 16 inches, uh, 13 sixteenths of an inch, sorry, less than one inch uh, in height um, and uh, basically one and a quarter inch uh, in depth. And this would run continuously here regardless of the length of the uh, of the uh, this uh, the the retailer or the tenant's name, so there be consistency, and this is a very slender uh, uplight, 
would just which would just illuminate the face of the bronze and the acrylic, which would actually take the light and sort of create this sort of diffuse uh, illumination behind the bronze. So that was the other component um, of the master plan. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you all may have um, and um, hear your thoughts. Excuse me, I was muted. <laughs> okay, so I um, I was looking for raised hands. I don't see any, so um, we'll go ahead and move to testimony. Lisa, sorry for the delay. Um, we do have a person signed up to speak. Uh, Kelly, Carol. Okay, Kelly, I've unmuted you. Yep. Great. This is Kelly Carroll for Historic Districts Council. HDC has long advocated for the proper restoration of Rockefeller Center's Fifth Avenue storefronts. Regarding the 1998 storefront intervention, we testified to the commission at that time, quote, while Hood's fully realized design with a specific relationship of glass to masonry may no longer be the popular design for a storefront, we feel strongly that it is crucial for the commission to protect the features of this complex that make it a world-class landmark. The Fifth Avenue facades constitute such a feature, end quote. HDC upholds this view in 2020 and asks that a storefront master plan regarding Fifth Avenue be based on historic evidence in order to revive the intended design for one of the most iconic pieces of architecture in New York City. It was Raymond Hood's intention to have a jewel box aesthetic for Fifth Avenue complete with black transom signage bands and recessed entries. If the storefronts will not be restored now, then when? Two of the proposed storefront prototypes, A1 and B2, are inappropriate for Fifth Avenue. Storefront type A1 retains a tripartite configuration, but its door features a side light, which makes the composition asymmetrical. On storefront B2, the awkward entry side light is featured again, and the door's placement to the far right creates a discordant composition. Neither of these options are appropriate storefronts, and we hope that LPC will approve a master plan that harkens back to the 1930s. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, and that was the only person in the waiting room and who signed up to speak. Thank you, Rich. Do we have a resolution from Community Board 5 or any mm -hmm. other written testimony? Yes, we have a resolution from Community Board 5 and it's broken up into parts, so bear with me for a moment. Um, they uh, recommend approval for the Certificate of Appropriateness for the expansion of the Master Plan for 45 Rockefeller Plaza. Um, and they recommend denial for the Certificate of Appropriateness for the modification of openings and replacement uh, storefront entry and infill. And they recommend approval for the Certificate of Appropriateness for the addition of signage to the four main entryways at 45 Rockefeller Plaza. Okay, so we'll be reviewing, as, they, as we said, three applications today. So the first one is to expand the master plan. And so my understanding is that the Community Board 5 recommended approval of this particular application. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. I also wanna just note for the record that Commissioners Bland and, and Commissioner uh, Goldblum are recused on this item and are not participating in, this, uh, in any of these three applications. Okay, um, Cass, is there anything you'd like to say to respond to the testimony? Um, um, I, I think I'd just like to clarify um, something for the Fifth Avenue um, storefronts if necessary. I think, um, you know, we're not looking to um, undo the commissioner's approval from 20 years ago. We're, we're working within that and just allowing for um, four doors. Um, and perhaps if I can just um, run up to, um, one slide here, if you if you can bear with me. Um, the next slide, I think. Um, I also want to just point out that the um, that the that the proposed um, types that I think were mentioned by HTC A one and B two. Um, the recess is a is an essential component of all these storefronts. They were there historically on Fifth Avenue. Um, if one is to accept a recess, there has to be a uh, an 18 inch side light adjacent to the pull side of the door. So that is a, a, a accessibility requirement. 
um, and that does create an offset <clears throat> for the door, but it's actually quite typical for, um, uh, for, for any kind of recessed entry for a storefront. So we have the, the angled entry, which um, you know, recalls the historic configurations of the storefronts on Fifth Avenue. I'll also just reiterate or maybe point out, I may not have mentioned this before, but obviously with a master plan, this is only guiding future work. This does not, um, this does not mean that, you know, tenants or Tishman Spire are going to run out and do this work. This is only sort of as needed. Um, the idea is to maintain what is there. Um, and to make the process a, a bit easier down the line where the applicant can just work directly with the staff. But um, the idea is obviously to work within the existing masonry openings and not modify any of the openings. Um, and just to sort of work with the component parts of the historic storefront um, uh, kit of parts, let's say, in all of these different uh, uh, proposed types. Okay, thank you. And I think Cass, in your presentation, you, I think said that you would limit the options based on site conditions. And I, I wasn't sure if you meant that one of these uh, and menu options for doors might not be used on some elevations or at some storefronts. So I think, you know, I, I think there are some bays that are quite narrow. I'm, I'm not going to run over there, but okay. over at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, there are some bays that are actually quite narrow. We're not proposing um, a recessed door in that bay or um, other locations. We, we, I think generally we're trying to accommodate doors um, as there were historically in, you know, in storefront bays that currently have windows. Um, comparing the historic photos to the current conditions, many of these storefronts actually did have doors originally, but as they were, as they were leased, um, people took many bays at one time. So the doors were eliminated and windows went in. We're looking now at a, at a climate where uh, there's a desire to have smaller spaces. So introducing doors in window bays is something that is likely to happen uh, in the future. And we're just looking to accommodate that. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other <clears throat> questions, commissioners? Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, on existing Fifth Avenue elevation, do you have an elevation where you plugged in the new store types A or B in it, in that elevation? Um, we only have existing elevations um, for, for the buildings. We have the proposed elevations by type. Type, but so you don't have it plugged in into the facade in any way. Right, because it's, it's difficult to anticipate what what someone is actually going to want or if they're that's going true. to want it at all so that, that's true but the idea to see how it would look you know the proposal right it's kind of important. right okay. so i think you know what we've tried to accommodate with the types here on fifth avenue is uh you know the vertical mullions largely the sort of tripartite arrangement um except for for the b2 where that would get sort of proportionally <clears throat> awkward so we've tried to come up with a a series of limited options that could work together if necessary. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, not seeing any hands raised at this time. So I'm gonna suggest that we move to our discussion on this item and um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? <clears throat> uh, so moved. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second it? Second. Okay, all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll move to discussion. Um, and this uh, first application is to expand a previously approved master plan for one building to other buildings within the complex that have similar storefronts. Um, and as I understand it, the master plan um, maintains historic details um, and configuration uh, and uh, configuration of materials, but does um, allow for different door options. And um, as I also understand it from the applicant that the center has had a variety of um, door door options historically, there were larger spaces that had more door, one door or smaller spaces that had more doors. So um, the idea of having more doors is not inconsistent with the historic patterns here. And finally, that the proposal includes the um, illuminated sort of halo uh, underlit um, 
signage, externally illuminated underlit signage. So um, let's um, move on with our discussion on this one. And um, I'm gonna start, I guess, with Michael Devonshire. I'm, I'm generally okay with this. Um, I, I would like to have some sort of provision in the approval that calls for salvaging of any historic material that is extant for possible reuse in the future. Okay, great. All right, Commissioner Chen, I unmute you. Yeah, I'm in agreement with uh, Commissioner Devonshire. This is uh, historic, this is very important. It's iconic to New York City and uh, so to the degree possible, um, I hope the applicant will try to use the symmetrical version rather than asymmetrical one. Okay. And um, Commissioner Lutfi? You know, I'm in agreement. I guess I'm not quite understanding why there wouldn't be, why, why we wouldn't want the more symmetrical. Um, but other than that, I mean, I could go along with this. Okay. I mean, I think for me, the fact that it maintains the tripartite condition and the placement of the mullions um, and just inserts doors, to, that to me sort of retains the general spirit of the configuration and that's why I'm comfortable with it. And I also think that it's consistent with master plans that we've approved at other individual landmarks um, where there are block long buildings uh, with as multiple storefronts and, and multiple conditions. And I also think that, um, you know, that the fact that the applicant stated that the work would be done on an as needed basis and, and um, only as tenancy required a door. So if they didn't have a tenant that required a door, or if they had a larger tenant, they wouldn't necessarily do it. So it wouldn't be implemented everywhere. It's just a kit of parts as the applicant described it. Okay, so we'll move across the table to Commissioner Jefferson. On, on the pedestrian level, urban level, if all those four windows changed, it would be fine. I, I think it's a good proposal. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Um, I, I'm okay with the, the, the rest of the proposal, but the Fifth Avenue side um, is, is, is bothering me. And, and here, here's, here's, I think, the reason. Um, uh, and symmetry, so most of the, of the of the buildings in in rock center symmetry doesn't matter a lot because your pedestrian your view your 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 ant's eye view um, is from relatively close to the buildings and you see one set of windows and doors at a time you don't really get the full view that we're you know it's a little deceptive <laughs> to see the drawings we're seeing here because it it makes it seem like as you're on the street you see everything um, and you don't really see that fifth avenue is different Right when you stand in front of Saks, right, you see this um, symmetry, and and symmetry. And if you look at this this particular slide, you know that is what this view is all about, right? It's absolutely, it's almost absolutely symmetric. My, it's a little small here, so I'm not sure I can pick up any differences, but um, but it is um, almost absolutely symmetric. And so when you start installing these variety of options. Um, in one set of, in one area and not in another, you do actually see it. And it's the only part of the entire complex, I think, where you actually will get that full view with nothing disturbing you except the buses passing by. And so the one that really, if you're gonna do this, the one that really bothers me is B2. Um, and I guess that's because it seems to me that if we, um, even if you're gonna have um, one of, let's just say on the building on the left, um, you're gonna be putting in a door there, but not on the right. Um, the B2 um, disturbs that uh, tripartite um, setup. Um, so um, I could buy into the other three if I have to, um, but the visual of that B2 going in with nothing else or going in with any of the others it just ruins that perfect symmetry. So I do have a problem with B2. Otherwise I'm okay with it. 
And your problem with B2 is limited to Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue. That, that, okay. those, those four right there are the only place that I think the, that the relationship between, uh, between and among the various um, um, uh, storefronts actually matters. Okay. And Corey, can we just look at, if you, can you or Edith move the presentation back to the entire, the plan of the complex? Because I think there's the building that has the master plan that has Fifth Avenue storefronts and then the two other buildings that would get the uh, master plan are flanking the channel gardens. So currently um, the northernmost building has um, storefronts on Fifth Avenue and that master plan already exists. So we would, you're, John, you're talking about the two buildings that flank the channel gardens below it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, all right. And Commissioner Lutfi, I know you, we just, uh, you just commented, but I know you wanna add something. So I'm gonna go back to you. Uh, I'm She's muted. muted. I just, she shouldn't be. And you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I wanna say uh, Commissioner Gus, Gustafson did a good job of expressing my discomfort and I happen to agree with him. Yes. Uh, on the Fifth Avenue of the two on buildings, Fifth Avenue. 620 and 610. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yeah, I think that for me, the um, while I might agree that it would be nice for the Fifth Avenue side to retain a uniformity, whether that's a total symmetry or it's it's the other direction, it's the B2 version. It's not as important in my view, as the retention of historic um, elements and when possible, rather than kind of just replacing wholesale all um, and just for the sake of replacing them to, to make them new. Um, I think that retaining the old material is important. Okay, so that they should only do it as needed. Okay. All right, Commissioner Holford-Smith. Um, I agree with um, the, I guess, my, uh, Commissioner Devonshire and Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I think I can find this appropriate as long as the maximum amount of original material is maintained and only replaced as necessary to add new doors. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin. Uh, it's a difficult issue because uh, the symmetry is obviously very important and, and uh, attractive. At the same time, uh, we know we're in something of a crisis for retail stores and traditionally we approve um, a variety of storefronts and what's good about the plan obviously is we're establishing a pattern development for this very large and very important complex. Uh, and I agree with the applicant that it's going to be necessary to provide uh, more entrances to smaller stores. We're not going to see the Saks Fifth Avenue type of uh, store as much, perhaps large stores that have a lot of op uh, picture windows in effect or very large windows. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm understanding that they are going to preserve the material as much as possible and not uh, undertake uh, renovations except as needed. Um, I think I, I support the general plan and um, <coughs> including, uh, you know, sometimes losing symmetry where it might be more desirable. Okay. All right. So I think that um, we have enough to approve it with the sort of the caveat that um, that the work be done only on an as needed basis to retain as much historic fabric as possible and that um, any material historic material that is removed be salvaged. Um, I know some commissioners wanted to see uh, the B2 eliminated from Fifth Avenue, but I think we have six for it um, without that. So um, Commissioner Devonshire, would you make that motion? Yeah, I'm gonna have to switch screens here for a second, sorry. Okay, no problem. So uh, now we're starting to see the So this Okay. 
in the matter of LPC 2079496105th Fifth Avenue, 625th Avenue, 626th Fifth Avenue, 635th Avenue, 636th Fifth Avenue, 1 Rock Plaza, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Rockefeller Center, an individual landmark, an application to establish a master plan governing the future installation of storefronts and signage. I recommend approval. Finding that the master plan will assure the future uniform installation of storefronts and signage over time and will accommodate barrier free access <clears> to <throat> spaces. That the proposed variations and storefront configurations are consistent with the original site designer's aim of accommodating programmatic requirements of individual retail tenants while conforming to uniform standards as well as historic variations evidenced in photographs. That the bronze, glass, and granite materials of the proposed storefronts match those of the historic storefronts and details, proportions, and configurations, including full height display windows with splayed returns, recessed entries with frame doors, bulkheads, and transoms, are in keeping with the corresponding features of the historic storefronts. That the storefronts facing Fifth Avenue at 610, 620, 626, 636 Fifth Avenue, which were previously enlarged under a previous permit, and selected storefronts facing the sunken plaza and facing the promenade around the corresponding corners at 610 and 625th Avenue are distinct from the majority of the storefronts of the buildings in terms of their locations and taller heights. Therefore, the proposed flush mounted transoms above entries at these selected locations will not visually disrupt the historic uniform pattern of recessed entry transoms throughout the buildings. That the bronze dimensional lettered signs of the black glass spandrels will be attached with reversible adhesive and exposed acrylic sides of these letters will be unobtrusive in daytime while allowing for a soft glow at night from an external LED feature concealed within a shallow bronze channel attached to the storefront framing, thereby preserving the physical integrity of the glass sign bands. And that these changes will maintain the historic uniform visual character of the commercial basis that these landmark buildings, as well as the harmonious architectural character of the Rockefeller Center individual landmarks. And that these changes will take place only as needed. And when they take place, material that extant original historic material will be salvaged and stored for reuse. Okay, um, and Commissioner Chapin, will you second that motion? Second. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Yes. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Nay. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson. Oh, hold on. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Leffey. Aye. Commissioner Holbert Smith. Aye. Okay, with eight in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move to the next item, which is about specific storefronts. Correct, and a slightly different mix of addresses. So I'll go ahead and read those in. Item number eight, LPC 20-07948, application for a certificate of appropriateness, staying in Manhattan, multiple blocks and lots. This is 630 5th Avenue, AKA 45 Rockefeller Plaza, one Rockefeller Plaza and 50 Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, International One Rockefeller Plaza and Associated Press Buildings slash Rockefeller Center Individual Landmark. Three office buildings designed by a consortium of architects known as the Associated Architects with portions designed by a group of fine artists built in 1933 to 34, 1936 to 38 as part of an Art Deco style office commercial and entertainment complex. The application is to modify openings and replace storefront and entry infill. Terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, your name for the record again. Okay. Cass Stackelberg, um, Hagen's Quaysworth. I'm still joined with uh, with us with uh, E.B. Kelly, Tish Inspire, and Michael Gablini. And Michael's actually going to begin the discussion, so um, I will hand it to him. Yes, hello, commissioners. This is Michael Gablini of Gablini Shepherd. And um, I would like to um, introduce uh, this, which is uh, the 
storefronts which are seeking for this application to have operability in three locations along Rockefeller Plaza. That is at one Rockefeller Center, 50 Rock and also 45 uh, Rock. And these are three locations in which as part of the public realm dimension and the uh, initiative, uh, which is part of the public realm is to continue the historic uh, center and creating uh, a continual dynamic um, hub uh, for social activity. And in this case, it's for three specific um, F and B lease locations um, that we would like to activate and open uh, the storefronts for operability in order to allow uh, the interior to uh, spill out onto the street and vice versa. If we could go to the next. So this is a, a general uh, images, of course, uh, in every uh, city of the world in terms of how F&B is so essential uh, to the way which we now think of the public realm of how to create uh, very uh, sociable and dynamic um, spaces, which are really activated um, by food and drink. And while these are very specific, they're very, very important uh, in terms of activating uh, the three block long uh, plaza uh, in very specific locations. So that these happen on uh, the plaza edge and also um, at a setback location at 45 Rockefeller Center. And this is something which for us is that again, we're looking for the mindful balance between uh, the history and the legacy of Rockefeller Center, but also with the uh, very strategic and kind of curated uh, social activation and reactivation uh, of the public realm. Lastly, another point is how the public realm is being thought about, not only during the morning, afternoon, during the daytime uh, for all the tenancy and how to also uh, create lively uh, and very uh, social amenities and amenity base uh, for the center, but also to think about it in the evening. Uh, so daytime, nighttime, and also uh, as the evening is thought about how to re-engage the entire public area of the uh, campus from 6th Avenue to 5th Avenue uh, and to uh, create uh, places uh, for people uh, to gather uh, and to, uh, to congregate. And I would like at this point uh, to turn it back over to Cass. That for me is a, 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 an introduction of these three locations uh, for him to take you through uh, the rest of the application. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. So um, as Michael mentioned, there are three particular locations that we've identified um, uh, that are being uh, leased to food and beverage um, tenants. Um, and they are all located along Rockefeller Plaza. And this is all tied in, obviously, to the work that we've been talking uh, talking with you about and sort of activating this public realm. So the first area of work is at um, 45 Rockefeller Plaza, which is highlighted in the site plan. Um, and we're looking at um, these three bays that front onto the plaza here, uh, and these bays here that front onto a sort of recessed uh, terrace uh, that is off, uh, off of the street. Um, so an existing photo of the building um, known as the International Building, this um, is a 41-story uh, uh, commercial building. And as you'll see, in part, uh, the scale of these buildings, I think, allow also for this kind of intervention. So um, continuing on again, building elevations, this is uh, the south elevation and the west elevation, highlighting the areas of work down here and here. Just to point out on the heels of the master plan discussion, these are five bays that would normally fall under the master plan, but the work that we're proposing is work that we would like to carry out um, under a certificate of appropriateness, not under a master plan. These are modifications that are, are slightly different um, or considerably different than what, uh, what we've just presented to you. So there are distinctions and these do fall under uh, a separate application. Um, so looking at the existing, uh, existing conditions. So again, um, the bays that we're looking at here on the south elevation, uh, an entry bay with double doors, a revolver, and then a pair uh, a pair of doors uh, on the opposite side. So these three bays here on the south facing elevation. Um, existing elevation uh, above and a proposed elevation below. So 
Um, and then a, a detail elevation here, I'll uh, begin, sorry, uh, let me just go back. Um, and a big picture, the, the, the scope of work involves modifying the, the infill at the base um, of these openings uh, so that there would be uh, recessed doors uh, <clears throat> on the left and on the right, uh, and then operable windows here. So we'll get into detail in, in just a moment and changes to the revolving door um, to incorporate swing doors uh, on the outsides of the revolving door drum. Um, some existing photos on the Rockefeller Plaza side here. These windows are currently um, blocked out, blacked out. This was actually an approval, uh, a commission approval 15, 20 years ago for a, a restaurant tenant that's now um, vacated the space. Um, but obviously as part of our work, we're looking to uh, reopen these windows to allow for uh, visual and, and actual environmental physical connectivity between the interior uh, and the exterior. So this is the southeast corner, uh, sorry, southwest corner of the plan uh, of the building. And you can see, uh, see it here, the bays in question. Um, again, a detailed existing elevation with the uh, double doors here and here and the revolvers, uh, and then a proposed elevation with the windows in the closed position. This would include reconstructing the infill with recess door and side light for ADA um, uh, compatibility uh, in this bay. Uh, in this bay, you can see the um, sliding articulation, sort of folding articulation of the operable windows. Uh, these four leafs and these three leafs, these bays, as you can see by the dimension strings across the top, these are um, different widths, the bays themselves, so that um, necessitates a slightly different spacing for the operable panels. And then um, here at the revolving door, um, putting in swing doors uh, at the back and the front of the uh, revolving door drum. Um, it, this will allow for an accessible entry, but will also provide um, some environmental uh, assistance so that we don't have just a single door with cold air uh, blowing in uh, or out in the summer months um, at the revolving door uh, entry. Um, in the open position, um, with the, the doors uh, or windows uh, retracted um, back to the, the piers, you can see um, this elevation. Uh, again, the component parts of these storefronts are consistent with uh, the component parts of all the adjacent bays. We have a granite base, a light statuary bronze door, um, the, the signage across uh, the sign band, dark statuary bronze framing, uh, and then just operability sort of inserted into uh, the storefront window zone. Um, an existing photo uh, and a rendered view of the, of the doors in uh, the, uh, the windows in the closed position and in the open position. Uh, there is no change to the width or the height of the opening. All the, uh, all the work occurs within the storefront aperture. Uh, and there's a consistency, obviously, with the sign band to, um, to the adjacent bays. Um, turning to the Rockefeller Plaza elevation. So this is a full elevation uh, from 51st Street here to 50th Street. The bays that we're um, looking at here uh, are these three. Again, photographs here showing these currently blocked out. Uh, I'll just note that this bay here, uh, detail three, uh, historically, this was a building entry. Um, like this, it was recessed, but was infilled many decades ago uh, and has a sort of more typical storefront sign band treatment you can see in detail here. So this is the area of work on the plaza side for this location. So again, an existing uh, elevation of the base of the building on the top and proposed below, um, introducing operability uh, to this window and to this bay uh, and inserting a, a door for, uh, for service uh, in, this, in this storefront bay. Um, detail elevation of the existing uh, and the plan indicating the blocked in windows that will be removed, these partitions that will be removed, uh, and then a proposed with uh, the windows closed. So again, introducing a, uh, a door here uh, into, uh, into this window bay for service, um, allowing for operability for, these, uh, for, these, for this window bay, and then introducing a, a door and uh, operable windows in this bay. Um, in the open position, um, existing photo on the left and a rendered view with the windows shut and with them open. Uh, again, the apertures uh, really don't change. Uh, and the consistency can be read across the head and, and the, the sort of rhythm of each of these bays. Um, looking at some of the detailing, this is a, an existing uh, elevation and sectional details. And the idea here really is to insert this system within, uh, within the typical storefront uh, framing. So you have 
the um, building standard uh, bronze framing with this new system set within that. Um, we think it is likely that we will need to replace uh, the, the entire framing in order to get the, the structural requirements satisfied, um, but all the details will match uh, the existing details um, that, uh, that remain both the historic and the, and the remaining details. Um, turning to the uh, similar uh, set of details um, to the south, now we're at one Rockefeller Plaza, down at the southern end of Rockefeller Plaza, uh, and the area of work here are these three storefront windows, which are currently windows now. We're looking to introduce uh, operable windows and doors in these bays uh, as well. Um, Again, scale, I think, is important. Uh, the overall uh, scale of the building, this is a 36-story building. Uh, we're just looking at these three windows here uh, at the base of the, uh, of the west elevation. Um, exist Oops, sorry, I'm going. Um, me trying to advance differently. OK. Um, some existing photos. So this is a, a full elevation uh, on the west side of the building, and the detailed photos of the existing um, of the existing three storefront windows uh, highlighted here: one, two, and three on the key plan. Uh, an existing and proposed elevation again. So introducing um, doors uh, in these two bays um, with operable windows, and then just operable windows uh, in this bay. Um, an existing photo and plan just to illustrate sort of how this space would be used. Obviously, this is about uh, making a connection uh, between the inside and the sidewalk um, for use during uh, morning, uh, midday, and, and the evenings as well. Uh, an existing elevation, uh, proposed elevation with the bays, uh, with the windows shut, um, and then uh, with those open. Um, obviously, we'll be able to maintain the granite um, that shouldn't uh, need to be replaced. We'll have to remove some for the door, but it is our expectation that we will need to replace uh, the bays here in order to accomplish um, the, uh, the operability of the windows. Uh, an existing photo on the left and a rendered view on the right with the doors and windows shut, uh, and then with the windows open. Um, again, typical um, sign types across, uh, across the sign band. Um, same materials, the light statuary bronze for the doors, the dark statuary contrasting material for all the framing elements. Um, some details or elevations, um, vertical section. My apologies, this is um, showing a recess, but actually it is all detailed as a flush installation. So this door would be flush with the windows. Um, I'll skip past that. Uh, and then the final location is part of uh, this group of three uh, proposed interventions is up here at 50 Rockefeller Plaza. This is the uh, historically known as the Associated <coughs> Press Building. Um, and there are three bays that we are um, looking to make um, this adjustment to. So um, two bays here that front directly onto the plaza and then one bay that's recessed within this, uh, this area you can see uh, in some of the details. Again, uh, relatively uh, tall building, 15, 15 story building. And again, the three elevation, the three windows, these directly on the plaza and this bay that is recessed off the, uh, off the plaza. Some existing photos, a full photo elevation across the facade. Um, 50 Rockefeller Plaza, which was constructed in the late 1930s, sort of within the first group of buildings at the center, um, does have a different articulation across the base. Uh, unlike the buildings that we were just looking at at 45 and One Rock or any of the buildings in the, uh, the fall under the master plan, uh, the storefront infill here is different. Uh, the way these windows are articulated, obviously there are these very tall sort of four light um, panels that come down nearly to the, to the street. Uh, there are revolving doors uh, here and here. Uh, this is a detail here of this bay. Uh, the, 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 um, the leaves for the revolvers have been removed. Uh, there are two wood swing doors at the back of the um, of the revolving door. These are non-code compliant width, so need, these need to be replaced. And then there are uh, sliding panels that close at night. You can see this is the closed position, this is the open position. Those would be retained in this, in this proposal. Uh, so an existing uh, elevation across the top and a proposed elevation across the bottom. We have a similar treatment uh, for these bays where we are actually making these panels single hung windows. So these could be raised up. You'll see this in greater detail in section. And then for this bay, which is a separate space, it doesn't connect to this space, 
we're looking to introduce a swing door and then folding uh, folding panels uh, here uh, to the uh, to this to the left. Um, existing uh, existing photo of the building entry with the remarkable Noguchi stainless steel sculpture directly above. Uh, this is the single bay here that's recessed off the building face, and then these two other bays here to the south. Um, interestingly, the um, a photo from 2000 when the uh, plaza was being reconstructed, um, much of the granite across the base of actually all the buildings that fronted uh, onto the plaza was actually removed and replaced as part of waterproofing. But just drawing your attention to this bay, um, currently uh, it matches this condition, but actually in 2000 uh, it, had a, it had a swing door uh, and then a window adjacent to it. So the, the, the condition today um, is different than what it was um, approximately 20 years ago. Um, we don't have great designation photos, so I can't tell you exactly how it appeared at the time of designation, but it does, uh, it did have a swing door in the location that we are proposing a door currently. So again, looking at uh, the existing conditions, uh, existing photos, uh, this would be uh, one uh, food and beverage um, location uh, with a single light, uh, single hung windows. We could open these up to allow for connection um, through this bay and this bay, this door uh, would remain the front door. Uh, this uh, is a swing door that would be set within the midpoint of the drum here uh, to allow for accessible entry into this space. And then the swing door and folding panels here uh, for a separate smaller space here, uh, but important to be able to have a door to get us into this space, which is uh, distinct from, from this much larger retail space currently. And you can see in the existing plan, this is all one retail space. So part of this discussion that we've been having about the sort of changing uh, landscape of, of retail, uh, there will be a desire or need even to separate this space from this space and therefore uh, allow for uh, additional doors. Uh, an existing elevation um, and then a proposed elevation showing uh, the, the lowering of the granite sill here to allow for these panels um, to come down to grade. Um, these two bays, the changes to the revolving door uh, uh, installation here with a single swing door and a side light. And then the changes here in this recess set back about 20 or 30 feet from the plane of the, of the face of the building with a swing door here and then the folding panels uh, here. Uh, and then in the open position indicating the sort of single hung nature of these panels um, and, the, and the open quality of this with this center post for the, uh, for the door operation. Um, some sections, this is an existing uh, overall section at the base and some detailed sectional information. Um, you can see this low um, granite curb about one, uh, 12 inches. This would be removed to allow for this, uh, these panels to come down to grade. The, the, uh, the configuration of these panels would change slightly. They're currently seven, one, uh, seven foot one each in height. Uh, we would adjust that to about seven, seven to accommodate the removal of this 12 inch step. Um, similarly, there are very modest um, dimensional changes. So uh, this horizontal million at two and three quarters uh, would grow just slightly. Um, the other dimensions would largely uh, stay the same. Um, looking at the jam, so now this is a plan section of the existing and a plan section um, of the proposed. Uh, there would be a slight increase uh, one inch uh, at the jam section to allow for operability of the lower panel. So again, these would become single hung where the lower panel could raise. Um, and so you can see a three inch uh, uh, jam profile here. Uh, we'd be just for this element, we'd be increasing that by one inch uh, on the sides, um, uh, the sides of those two openings. And then at the swing door um, within the recess, again, an existing uh, plan section and proposed. Um, Really, no change in the in the profile here from three inch to three from from three inch to three inch, but a slight different configuration. And you can see the the post that would support the swing door, and then these um, uh, folding operable windows, which could tuck back uh, to one side. Um, existing photo on the left, uh, propo proposed photo uh, on the right. I think given the scale uh, and the fact that uh, we're on a corner, I think the adjustment of those six inches of where the uh, meeting rail would land really will be imperceptible in terms of the change um, and the removal of that granite also I think given the, the, the activity on the street I think will be will be difficult to actually uh, perceive. Um, 
sorry, and then that is that is our last slide. I'm happy to go back to that one and um, take any questions uh, you all may have. Okay, commissioners, do we have any questions for the applicant at this time? All right, I have one question, Commissioner Jefferson. Go ahead. Yeah, why why are you removing the base, the granite base? Um, in in this location. Yes. Um, so, I mean, Michael can speak to this, but I, it's just really about connectivity and allowing for people to flow from inside out. I don't know, Michael, do you want to uh, address that? Uh, this is a, a very important corner, of course, and uh, this is a part of uh, ongoing uh, negotiations uh, with uh, possible uh, tenancy. And this to become an F&B um, uh, facility to really activate um, this part of the plaza very essential to have literally a flush condition going from the interior to the outside uh, like you have in any kind of European uh, cities and also uh, other uh, restaurants uh, throughout uh, the city as well. Uh, so that is the primary uh, reason uh, to have a physical and visual connectivity uh, for uh, the restaurant uh, coming from the inside out, having outdoor seating, activating the plaza, but then also for servicing uh, and ease of um, a service from the inside out. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that, but it changes the proportion of the glass of the glass base. You know, the two pieces of glass were the same proportion. Now the proportion has changed and there's no base. So that's a question whether um, a or B is preferable, you know, but the facade has changed in, in terms of proportion. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, and just following up on that, it, are, are the proportions of the two panes in that lower display window the same? And do they, are they, in the photo, it looks like they're larger, but are they larger than the spandrel above and then the window above that? Currently, do they? Um, I they they grow they each grow by six inches. Um, I let me, let me go back to the um, go back to the elevations. I think I think they are six inches taller than the spandrel as well. Um, I don't think we have a dimension on that, but I think um, they are uh, they are equal. Um, what I will say just to that in terms of changing the proportion, I think in the in the in the straight elevation you can read the the equal parts. But I think when you're on the street, because that spandrel panel is back painted, um, there's a break where you don't sort of, there's a break between, certainly between the upper panel, uh, the spandrel and the lower panels. Um, and it's just a different, it's just a different reading. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that isn't perhaps as legible as it, as it appears in the elevation drawings. Okay. But right now the two lower ones are the same height and proportion. And to, to each other. To each other. Yes, and they and they will be. They will each be um, seven seven. Okay. Uh, but in the other... existing a uh, question. Go uh, ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. In you go existing, ahead. Oh, in the existing uh, facade, the two glass portions are exactly the same, right? They're, they're the same proportion, correct? In right. terms so of the vertical they, height. Right. They are currently seven foot one each panel. And we are proposing by reducing a, okay. the 12 inch curb, increasing them to seven foot six each. Oh, sorry, anyway, sorry, so seven foot both seven. Of them are seven. They will be equal. So they're both seven foot six. Sorry, they're going from seven the foot one panel. and they are both going to seven foot seven. They each grow by six inches. Okay. So the principle, if okay. I can, the principle, if I can offer is to keep them equal. Um, but they do grow in size. Um, that is the principle that we um, thought about uh, going forward. Okay. All right, other questions? Anyone else? Okay, well, we'll move to public testimony now. We can continue questions if there are more after the testimony. Lisa? Yes, and there is nobody in the waiting room to testify. Okay, all right. And Rich, uh, I think the community board recommended denial of this application. So this is for the modifications of openings and replacement storefront entry and infill. They recommended denial for this, correct? 
Okay, and any other written testimony? No, I have no further written testimony. Okay, all right. Um, Can I just actually address that? Of course. I'm, I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna speak at length because I don't wanna torture people, but it was a very irregular uh, experience with the community board. Um, the, the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 5 supported this application unanimously. They had some specific um, comments, um, but that vote was reversed um, by their executive committee without benefit of a presentation. So I'll, I'll just note that, but we did have unanimous support um, for, for all three areas um, that we're proposing. We did actually make some adjustments um, to address their comments, particularly on the, uh, the work at, um, at one Rockefeller Plaza and 45 Rockefeller Plaza where they had commented, and this was about having recessed entries, they had commented on the number of vertical mullions that, that came about because of the recess. And so we actually adjusted those, uh, those uh, proposals to minimize the number of vertical mullions to sort of quiet down the, 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 the elevation a little bit. Uh, but the committee was, was very supportive. So I'll just add that. <laughs> that okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions on this application? All right, not seeing any questions, I'm gonna suggest that we move to close this hearing. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you make that motion? And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. All in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay. So we're going to move to our discussion on this one. And so these are um, discrete openings on um, three different buildings that um, are being proposed to become operable. And in some cases, it includes um, folding doors that would have more mullions when closed. And in, in the case of 50, at two of the three openings, it would um, have a window that slides up that is a slightly different proportion than the original, but maintains the overall configuration. So, um, Let's see, um, why don't we start with Commissioner Jefferson, since you had some questions, do you, would you like to start this discussion? Sure, sure. On the, um, on the, the first question, the first part, um, if you go back to the, the, the windows that are, the doors that are adjustable, uh, which one of those? Uh, yeah, I don't mind the adjustable uh, windows that move back and forth. I think that's fine. Okay. My, my only disagreement with the proposal is at 50 Rockefeller. I think once you decide to change the way a building hits the sidewalk or hits the earth, you're really changing an elevation. And you can see clearly from this elevation that you know two bays, two window bays, are totally different from the rest. And it's just kind of, uh, it, it, I, I think they should keep the base and I don't see any reason why not. You get the transparency, you get the windows, you get the, the same feel of inside out without destroying um, the, the, uh, the, right. the detail at the base. Okay, so allow it to be operable, but keep the base, okay. Yes. All right. And thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. You know, um, this is, uh, this is, goes back to my comment from the last yeah. item. <laughs> well, this view is not a view that you really can see, you know, in, in real life. I mean, you know, I guess, you know, we see this in the, uh, in the elevation, we get this wonderful clear view of the asymmetry between the left and the right. But when you're standing on Rockefeller Plaza, you don't actually see that. Um, it, it's not really possible. Maybe at maybe at three o'clock in the morning, if you stand far <laughs> enough away, but you're never really going to see it. So I'm I'm okay with. Um, I don't like removing the the fabric, but but I'm okay with it. Okay, thanks. All right, and Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, so I well I can approve the and think are appropriate the um, operable panel operable doors. Um, I do think that. What that the proposal on Fifth Avenue and Fifty Rockefeller Center is really interesting. The the new um, 
the new horizontal piece as it as it uh, hits the ground, as, as Commissioner Jefferson was saying, is actually a really interesting solution because that that kind of heavy window, it's a vertical window, but it has a horizontal expression, is so variable the way that it that it currently hits uh, sort of almost hits the ground that it's an interesting kind of play on it to actually have it act almost like a double hung, you know, and reach reach all the way to the bottom or pull up a little bit higher. And so I think that this new detail is, is very interesting and is in keeping with the um, sort of the design language of this facade. I think the only thing that I am opposed to uh, is uh, on, on 50, the vertical openings in the third bay. Okay. All right, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I listening to both sides about the the new double hung, um, which I think is a really ingenious solution. Um, I think that I can um, find it appropriate for the new opening to go down to the go down to grade. Um, I don't think you're going to perceive it in relation to the other windows. Uh, and I have, in general, um, uh, an issue with the vertical division of all of these bays into uh, folding. Um, I don't really object to the idea of, of having them be operable, which is always lovely. But every every window that they've divided, it's in um, it's in fourths, whereas almost all the other windows divided in thirds. Now I don't know if that's a, a limitation of the. the the operable windows or doors, um, but I would really prefer to see um, a tripartite division of those. And that goes across the board. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I, I find the, uh, the vertical windows on the 50th street side uh, just seem to be more disruptive of the facade than um, than some of the other changes. Um, and I'm troubled a bit by that. The rest of it, I'm very, pretty comfortable with. I can afford. Okay. Um, Commissioner Devonshire. I'm uh, uncomfortable with most of it. I am uh, not in favor of the uh, vertical divisions of the, the uh, window at 50 Rockefeller Center. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Sorry. So, Diana, just the the vertical divisions at the bay on one bay on 50 Rockefeller Center, but you're comfortable with the vertical divisions in the other bays in the other storefronts on on uh, Sixth Avenue? Yes, I'm. I'm uh, I just I said 50th Street. I'm at 50 Rock. <laughs> okay. Like... Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Um, hmm. Did I go? Oh, I haven't. Commissioner Chen. Sorry. Uh, no, I, no. Sorry. Um, I agree with most of the comments. I think the Commissioner Gustafson is correct. The elevation on the side, you're not going to notice it. And uh, given the, uh, the, 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 um, no one is actually going to see it uh, because this is a very rectilinear hypothetical uh, up, uh, projection. Uh, so I have less problem with that, that uh, seven feet seven. Uh, I also have no problem with it uh, being flush with the ground because it makes it easier not tripping uh, and uh, ADA access. Um, and uh, I'm in agreement with the, the most of the rest of the comments. Okay. So I believe that we have six commissioners who would support the proposal if the um, vertical divisions in the bay just here, uh, to the south of the main entrance on number 50 were eliminated, those vertical lines. Um, I think that um, Commissioner Jefferson would not support the, removing the curb and Commissioner Holford Smith has um, concerns about the vertical mullions in all of the operable doors, but I think everybody else is comfortable with 
an approval with um, the modification to just eliminate this one um, operable set of doors at number 50. So um, I think, can I, yes. Can I just, my apologies to step in. I know we're not supposed to be talking, but. Um, okay, wait, can you, uh, right. I'm gonna, um, yeah. oh, gosh. I have to open up the hearing to have you talk, Cass. Is there okay. any way that you can communicate with Corey? Um, I can text him. <laughs> okay. Just, we can. There's a very specific question about those doors okay. um, in the recess. All right. Let's let's have a motion to open the hearing. So yeah. moved. And second. a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Cass, go ahead. My apologies. Um, I, I think because that space um, is its own um, or will be its own space, having a door. Uh, in that bay is very important. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you and the commissioners would feel about going back to that condition that appears, and I don't know if Edith is controlling this or if I am, but um, in the 2000 photo um, where there was a single door and a large window adjacent, if that arrangement would be acceptable because that will allow us to actually get into, um, into that single space, which is now will be separate from that very large retail space. Um, and I don't know right. if- Okay, you know, so a single if, window with a door so that you yeah, can so, have a separate so it, tenant there. Right, okay. so whether it's a single door or maybe even a, mm -hmm. a double door and a large window um, where we'd have a granite base and then and then doors, that would be, we could, we could accommodate losing the operability, but we do need a way in. Okay, all right, thank you. So Commissioner Devonshire, did I actually call on you? <laughs> I apologize if I didn't. Yes, you did. And okay. I'm, I was in favor of- Oh yes, that's right, I've got you here. Except the vertical and I'm, if you're asking me now, I'm not in favor of the additional door that Cass is asking for. Okay. Um. And just, just as one uh, point of information, uh, this photo that you're looking at shows a 2000 condition. I did check the designation photographs and there was a door at that location at designation, but I. I have no idea if that is a, a later alteration in itself. I haven't seen a historic photo of that. Okay, so I think that, you know, we had about six um, in favor of uh, the operable doors with the exception of this one at 50. And I think that if among our, the six, if we have at least one that is concerned about allowing at least one door here, then I don't think we can take a motion to, uh, we can make a motion today. So. Um, is it possible to vote on the other properties and leave this one out? Yes, I think we could do that. And then okay. we can restudy the number 50 at a separate okay. time. So okay. let's um, let's do that and um, so we have to close the hearing, Sarah. If we're going to yep. move forward. Yep. Okay. Can we have a? Uh, oh, Commissioner Lutfi has a question. Go ahead or a comment. Actually, the comment was that I was the person that you did not. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I thought there was somebody. <laughs> Yeah, you were right. There was somebody, but it wasn't. <laughs> so anyway, what I was going to say that I was in support of the, I was in support of it as presented. Okay, so then before we close the hearing, um, then I think uh, for um, um John, uh, no, I think Adi and um, Diana and Michael were the three that had concerns about this door, um, the door configuration next to the main entrance at 50. And I know Michael wouldn't approve a door at all. Can I ask um, Adi and Diana to revisit? And if the applicants are asking for a single door at this opening, similar to the time, the condition at the time of designation, would you support the application? Uh, go ahead, Diane. Adi, go ahead. I think not. Okay. All right. And Diana? Uh, I, I find this, uh, you know, the single door that's glass less intrusive uh, than the uh, multiple divisions. So it 
it's more acceptable to me, but it sounds like you do not have votes for it in any case. Okay, correct. Okay, so let's, um, I think we have enough votes uh, to vote on all of the other buildings except for 50 and we'll continue to revisit 50 at another time. So um, I'll go ahead and read this there, one. There, we yeah? need to close the hearing. I don't, there was no motion to close the hearing. All right, I will do I will. that. Um, can we have a motion to close the hearing? Diana, would you make that motion? Motion to close the hearing. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that? I second that. Okay, all in favor? I second that. Thank Aye. you. Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay. So this is um, item number eight. I'll just read this one. It's an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan. Docket number LPC 20-07948, 630 Fifth Avenue, also known as 45 Rockefeller Plaza, 1 Rockefeller Plaza. Um, this is the 1 Rockefeller Plaza and, Plaza and Associated Press Buildings Rockefeller Center Individual Landmark. Three office buildings designed by a consortium of architects known as the Associated Architects with portions designed by a group of fine artists built in 1933 to 34 and 1936 to 38 as parts of an Art Deco style office, commercial and entertainment complex. This is an application to modify openings and replace storefront and entry infill. And I recommend approval uh, for changes to um, 630 5th Avenue, also known as 45 Rockefeller Plaza and to one Rockefeller Plaza, finding that the proposed installation of operable storefront windows is limited to specific locations facing onto um, Rockefeller Plaza and neighboring corners and reflects the historic programmatic goal of creating a vibrant gathering place with ease of movement by pedestrians and patrons between the public and commercial spaces at the landmark site, that the overall compositions and proportions of the new storefront infill are in keeping with corresponding features of the existing and surrounding storefront infill at these buildings, and the bronze, steel, glass, and granite materials, including beveled frames with a statuary bronze statuary finish and polished bronze doors with single glazed panels match those of historic storefronts at these buildings and other buildings at the landmark. That certain historic components, including bronze perimeter framing, awning housings, black spandrel sign panels, portions of revolving door surrounds, and related entry paving will be maintained at the openings that the changes to retail entry configurations, including either the introduction of side lights or flush door installations and the replacement of revolving doors with swing doors will accommodate barrier-free access at these select retail and building entry bays, that the new operable folding display windows when open will recall the single light configurations of historic display windows and when, and when closed, we'll recall the vertical corner framing components and mullions at surrounding single or tripartite display windows throughout the landmark site. And that the work will blend unobtrusively with surrounding architectural features at the landmark. And um, that, uh, and I recommend that the storefront proposals for 50 Rockefeller Plaza, uh, that we take no action on the storefront proposal for 50 Rockefeller Plaza and allow the applicants to consider the commissioner's comments on that storefront. And can we have a second, um, Commissioner uh, Chapin? Second. Okay, and Rich, will you call that vote? Yes. Okay. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shimmy Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? No. Okay, with eight in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that one is approved in part. 
and you can continue to work with the staff as you consider reconsider uh, 50 Rockefeller Plaza. And we'll move on to the third item. Okay, right. And uh, this is the last item. It's item number nine, LPC 20-07947, application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1266, lot one in part, uh, 635th Avenue, AKA 45 Rockefeller Plaza, International Building uh, slash Rockefeller Center Individual Landmark. Uh, and this particular application is to install signage. And please state your name for the record. You may begin. Sure. Cass Stackelberg, Higgins Grace Barthman Partners. I'm still, still with E.B. Kelly of Tishman Spire and Michael Gabellini. Um, as Corey mentioned, this is um, fortunately a very straightforward proposal. <laughs> and hopefully we can move through this quickly. Um, this is for um, <clears throat> installation of uh, pin mounted signage in um, the four locations at the four uh, main building entries at 45 Rockefeller Plaza. So again, our, our site plan and the proposal is uh, for work uh, here at the, at the entries to 45 Rockefeller Plaza here uh, on 51st Street at the Plaza entry and at the recessed entry uh, on the 50th Street side. Um, again, this is for uh, pin mounted signage, signage that is similar to uh, existing signage seen throughout the center as well uh, as signage on the building. So just a, a few historic photos. You probably know this well, or at least can envision it. Um, pin mounted signage is the sort of typical um, way signage is done throughout the center and has been done throughout the 1930s uh, to the present. It's been used for both uh, wayfinding signage, uh, this detailed photo showing both Rockefeller Plaza called out here and, and the tenant uh, building name signage, the RKO building, um, and then ground floor tenant signage, a uh, national cash register here, which was at 50 Rock, um, uh, uh, Chase Bank um, and uh, uh, Bankers Trust and Morgan Guarantee. So um, signage is typically done sort of in different locations, different scales, uh, but is used uh, historically throughout the decades to uh, identify uh, tenants, building names uh, and wayfinding. And today, uh, one sees the same uh, range of uh, signage, typically quite small uh, and pin mounted onto, uh, onto the limestone. Um, at, um, at 45 Rockefeller Plaza, there is a range of different signage, uh, but at the pedestrian scale at the entries, typically again, pin mounted signage. Um, at the building entry on Atlas Court, there is uh, incised signage that's been cut into the granite. Um, and then also um, above the entry on 51st Street, the International Building, but the tenant signage, both the retail tenants for Banana Republic and All Saints, that's handled with pin mounted signage flanking the entries. Um, the building address on the Rockefeller Plaza and 50th Street elevations also done uh, with uh, statuary bronze pin mounted signage. Um, and we are looking to match that, uh, that building standard. So the first location we are um, proposing signage is within Atlas Court. So behind Atlas on these two piers. Again, there is incised uh, signage here. We're looking to install pin mounted signage onto, uh, onto the limestone above the granite. Um, some existing photos, um, the incised lettering, International Building, 635th Avenue, um, and the existing elevation above and the proposed elevation uh, below with um, the signage location called out symmetrically on, um, on either pier. So what we're proposing is up to um, four tenant names uh, on these piers. Uh, and then we have details. Uh, this is a, a proposed elevation uh, indicating the location and then details for the signage. So this is the incised letters, which would of course remain. Uh, and then the proposed uh, and existing uh, signage matching, matching the building standard, two and three quarter inches, three eighths of an inch uh, deep and uh, the uh, medium to light statuary bronze finish pin mounted onto the limestone. Um, so an existing photo on the left and a rendered view on the right. Um, and then continuing around onto the 51st Street side, uh, existing photo of the entry, this recessed entry um, on the 50th Street side, again, building signage um, located here to the right of the entry. Um, our proposal is just to um, add signage below the building address on the left side is part of the, the artwork program and there's carved uh, limestone. Obviously we don't wanna impact that visually, physically. So all the signage is uh, on the far right side where the existing signage is now. Uh, this would be limited to two tenants uh, with single, uh, single line of signage. Again, 
the pin mounted uh, letters two, in, two and three quarter inches uh, and statuary bronze. Um, looking at the 51st Street side, currently uh, there is building address signage to the right of the uh, building entry. Um, we are proposing uh, in elevation to uh, match the 45 Rockefeller Plaza uh, in a, on, the, on the left side with international buildings, so a bit of additional wayfinding, and then to allow for um, building tenant uh, names. This is the only location where we are allowing for a tenant that would have, if the name of the tenant was long that required two lines of text, it would only occur in this location. All other tenant names would be single lines of text and that same, uh, that same dimension, two and three quarter inches. So um, uh, existing elevation above, proposed elevation below, um, and then a rendering photo on the left uh, and a rendering uh, on the right, uh, just showing the addition of the building name, international building, and then the building uh, tenant signage below. Uh, and then finally, um, on the Rockefeller Plaza elevation, again, the building entry here, we have a building address um, here, and then looking to add building signage, uh, tenant signage rather, um, on, on both sides. Again, identifying the name of the building with the international building to flank the building address, and then symmetrically to allow for a single line of text with two, uh, two tenant names uh, below to, uh, to match the other locations. Um, consistent with building signage on the building, um, consistent with the way uh, signage has been handled throughout the center um, since, since its completion in the 1930s. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions on this one? All right, not seeing any questions. Lisa, do we have public testimony? Uh, we have nobody in the room waiting to testify. All right, thank you. And Rich, the community board approved this one, I believe, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and there is no other written testimony? Nothing else hasn't already been mentioned. Okay, all right. Okay, any final questions or any final comments, Cass, before we move to our discussion? I see Commissioner Chen has a question, so let me start there. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, that this is customary has been done. Uh, in the past, when the tenant moves out, uh, the, uh, the, re uh, the repair to the pinhole uh, yes. How is that handled, and and is that uh, you know? Uh, can you describe uh, the methodology and the protocol? Of course. So um, typically, there's sort of two ways of doing this, and as you can imagine, over the decades of um, pennant turnover, um, typically the way this is handled when the pin uh, the, the signage is removed, um, there are one or two one of two um, uh, restoration mortars that are used, and we've provided this staff with a specification for that repair. It's either a Yon product or, or Edison coatings, pretty standard um, material for patching limestone. I will say that um, over time, Tishman Spire has um, found it necessary to replace entire units of limestone where there are just so many pinholes. And these are things that have, you know, were inherited when they took over the center in the late 1990s. There are some locations where there just were so many patched holes that really looked terrible that it was necessary to replace the entire limestone unit with a replacement shot sawn limestone unit. So that's not typically done, um, but we will be patching any holes with, with a restoration mortar um, up to a point where there's a decision to replace the unit. Thank you, that's what I was concerned about. Of course. All right, Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, it, it, Kaz, is that what's going on with this image that we're looking at right here? The um, you know, it's very hard to see because it's small, but it looks like this is they've, they've replaced two of the panels, uh, two of the sections on this. Is that what happened there? I, yeah, I'm not sure. Particularly the one on the right. Um, this doesn't look um, as crisp as this one. This one may have been replaced. We can find out. I'm not exactly sure what um, what the uh, condition of this stone is. They may have been they may have been replaced. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's move to close the hearing and Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make that motion? So moved. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, so let's start our, oh, and all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, all right. Um, Commissioner Lutfi, let's start with you in this discussion. This is for this tenant signage at the building entries? Um, it seems uh, 
perfectly fine to me. I mean, the signage is very discreet and understated. It's they've, you know, they've done these signs before and, you know, I appreciate the fact that they're gonna do what they need to do to uh, make sure that the limestone, if it's damaged, is either repaired or replaced. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Uh, I, I agree. Okay, Commissioner Deminger. I'm, I'm in favor of this. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Gustafson? Uh, well, uh, while, you know, the uh, use of pin mounted signs typically might not be something we would love, uh, opposing it at Rock Center seems like opposing mom and apple pie. Um, <laughs> and, if, and, if, and if Commissioner Devonshire is in favor, is in favor of it here, I've got to be, so. Uh. Okay, one of the reasons I'm in favor of it is when these things were happening before and there were pinholes all over the place, they typically got, filled with Portland cement. Now we're a lot smarter about that kind of stuff. And I think it'll probably be uh, 2090 before they have to replace a, a piece of stone again. Excellent. Great. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I can support the application. Okay. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, I'm in favor of this. And Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes and Commissioner Jefferson. It's very tasteful. Okay, all I right, so, thank you. So we can move to approve that. And um, let's see, who haven't I called on today? Commissioner Lutfi, would you make that motion? Sure. Um, in the matter of docket LPC 20-07947, 635th Avenue, AKA 45 Rockefeller Plaza, International Building, Rockefeller Center, Individual Landmark. Do you hear all that noise outside of my window? An office tower and lower eastern wings, 626 and 636 Fifth Avenue, designed by a consortium of architects known as the Associated Architects with portions designed by a group of fine artists built 3334 as part of an Art Deco style office commercial and entertainment complex. The application is to install signage. I see, I recommend approval. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to note. I recommend approval of signage. Proposed <laughs> installation of the office tenant signage is limited to specific sections of plain limestone cladding adjacent to building entry portals in keeping with traditional installations that have occurred at the complex over time. That the proposed office tenant signage will match existing pin mounted bronze letters found at this and other buildings in the landmark complex in terms of material finish and installation and will relate well in terms of dimension and configuration that the signs are well scaled to the adjacent entries and will not overwhelm the building entries, and that the signs will not detract from surrounding significant architectural or art artistic features of the building and the Rockefeller Center individual landmark. Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? I will second that motion and it's perfect timing. I'm almost out of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, Rich, will Finally, you call them up? <laughs> sure, uh, <laughs> Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Gustafson. <laughs> you follow that up. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, nine in favor and unopposed. The motion carries. Okay, so that's approved. Thank, thank you all. all. Thank you. Um, thank, you thank you for another thank great you, thank you. day. So and thank we you. will see you. We are having a public meeting on Friday. So we'll see you on Friday. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a great thank evening. You.